programme. Okay, good morning, you're very welcome to um, this morning's meeting of the Infrastructure Committee. Apologies for the delay, we're having some technical issues. Um, we have a quorum, in fact we have all members in attendance, either via Starleaf or in the Chamber. Um, and just advise those who are in the Chamber to maintain their social distancing throughout the meeting. Um, today we will be considering the subordinate le some subordinate legislation. We will also be receiving a, a briefing from the Minister in relation to COVID-19 and also further current issues. And we will receive a briefing from the Department giving us a budget update. Members, um, you will know obviously that we are going to have a mixture of um, witnesses in person and also um, via Starleaf. Um, if members who are joining us via Starleaf can do the usual in so much as raising their hands if they wish to ask a question at each agenda item and also to mute their mics when not asking questions just to ensure that there's no interference with um, the evidence session. Um, the room has to be vacated by 1pm, so um, I will probably issue reminders just throughout the meeting with regards to our timing. Um, I don't have, I haven't received any apologies. And then moving then to Chair's business, just advise you that the online survey for the committee's inquiry has closed and this is outlined um, in your table papers at page three. And there's a clerk's note on the response and outlining the next steps. And if you don't mind, I'll just call Vincent just to maybe just give us a brief outline with yeah, regards to that. Well, there's nothing much in it, members. It's just that um, the the survey and the call for evidence ended over the weekend. So we've had 748 responses to the online survey, and some of the details are there in that clerk's memo. And the call for evidence finished as well, and we got. 17 responses, um, a mixture of councils, uh, departments and private sector. Um, this is going to be analysed now by the, um, the researcher and the next step then is to have um, a research briefing on the findings on the 19th of May. Okay, and aligned with that then we will receive a briefing from the department. Yeah. Okay, members content? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yes, thank you. Moving then to our draft minutes, at page six, there are the minutes of the meeting of the 14th of April. Are members content? Yes. Thank you. Moving then to matters arising at page 22, and again that's from the meeting of the 14th of April. Do members have any issues arising from that meeting? Ms Anderson. No? Okay, there's a raised hand. No one has well, no chair. Okay. Was, um, I'm, I want in a correspondence, sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, any new issues? Thank you very much then. At page 20, you'll see the outstanding um, committee requests for information. And the letter has gone out to late respondents, urging them to um, respond perhaps in a more timely fashion than they have been. So moving then to correspondence, um, just draw your attention to the correspondence memo at page 38. And while a number of um, issues are of um, pieces of correspondence are relating to um, our inquiry, there are some others that we may wish to consider. Um, obviously, in particular, there's the item with regards to um, the financial support for taxi operators, which has come in from Phoenix Law. Um, and other me members may wish to to highlight that as well. Um, and obviously, the need to, to urge. Um, um, for some sort of action with regards to that, and obviously that's a this has been an ongoing issue that members may wish to raise with the minister when she is here, as well. Uh, Miss Anderson, did you want to, to speak on this item? Um, yes, chair. Um, and I note the uh, on page eighty the correspondence from Phoenix Law, and where they say that their clients are available to attend at the committee. Um, should we? So wish to do so, and given the ongoing issue that we have been raised uh, and raising with the officials, and we have an opportunity, obviously, to raise with the minister as well, with regards to taxi drivers and taxi operators. I think, dependent upon what response we may get today from the minister, and I know I have an awful lot of other questions to raise with the minister as well. So I would like for the committee to consider um, bringing the clients, as they call them. 
um, but bringing a representation back into committee so that we can try to get their grievances, which I think at this stage, that's what they are, and that we can try again to present a resolution to this issue. Mrs Kelly? I'm sorry, Chair, I'm a wee bit confused in terms of uh, Phoenix Law. Is this something that we, the committee requires legal advice for? I'm just, no. Why, why are we hearing from... On their solicitor? Yeah. As opposed to directly from... Yeah. You know, should we not should we not be getting legal advice if this is going to be the subject of uh, uh, any further legal action at a later point? I'm just looking clarification. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, if, if members wish to raise the issue generally um, with the minister when she's here, and then give some consideration to that at the end of the meeting. I don't think we should. Yeah, it's not to put anything at risk, any outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other issues members wish to raise, Mr. Cahill or Mr. Cahill, Mr. Boylan? Thanks very much, Chair. Um, no, Chair, I, I, basically, Phoenix Law is representing a number of the taxi operators, so they're, they're requesting just to brief them themselves. I mean, I, I don't think there's any issues with that, to be honest. I don't, I don't think it's in, in I appreciate what Dolores is saying, but, but I, th I think it's, it's just the voice of the, the taxi operators. I mean, I think we should consider it as a committee. Mr. Muir? Um, thank you very much, <coughs> Chair, and good morning to everyone. Um, just in relation to the letter from Phoenix Law, I would share some of the concerns really from Dolores around that. Um, I'm very happy and I think it's important we engage with um, uh, taxi operators and taxi drivers and uh, I think it's important to do that, it's really, really important. But uh, just in terms of this letter, it has came from um, a solicitor for, and it is uh, from, a, from a legal perspective. So I think it would be important to get guidance if we were going to go down that route. Any other comments in relation to that, Ms. Anderson? Uh, well, well the, the Phoenix Law, my understanding of the letter, and maybe someone could correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they are not asking to meet with us. Um, it is the taxi drivers and the taxi operators who are asking to meet with us because of the experiences that they have had uh, throughout the pandemic and trying to get access to the grants and how they were handled. Um, so uh, I take on board what Dolores is saying, if there is an issue, because we may, if we're talking about even considering engaging with Phoenix Law, then of course we should get legal advice or whatever to, to ensure that all of that is above board. But I think what Phoenix Law just drawn to our attention is making representation on behalf of their clients, and they are not asking uh, to be in the room. I don't think that that's what I would advocate. I would advocate the, with the taxi drivers and the taxi operators that we hear from them. Chair. Mr. Chair, just, just on that point, Martina's put it and Callum's put it well, and so is Dolores and Andrew. I think it will be important that we don't take, and this is no disrespect to Phoenix, that we take direction from them. Yes, it's a, it's a sort of a request to us, but I think we would need to get legal advice before we seek even the meeting with the taxi operators yeah. or taxi drivers because we don't want to be seen to be taking direction from a law firm. No disrespect to them at all. I think it's important to get our own advice of what we can do on that. Okay, well, if, if, just to bring this one to a conclusion, if members are content to raise the issue generally around um, support to taxi, op or up to taxi operators from the department with the minister, and um, we can ask um, officials then to look at um, getting some advice in relation to the correspondence generally. And perhaps this could be a broader issue because this will not be the first or, or last time that we receive correspondence from a solicitor. No, no, I have no difficulty. I just think we need to be very careful as members knowing where we stand, you know, in terms of anything said or any in inference given. But that said, it's, it's, it is a, it's still a live issue. It's something yeah. which the committee has considered and there are numerous questions with regards to it. But it's not raising anything that we aren't aware of or that we aren't, we're not concerned is an outstanding issue. Uh, Ms. Anderson? Do you want to speak again? Okay. Our members can. Sorry. Okay. And I just ask members just to check their mobile phones because there seems to be some interference. If you could just check that. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So you're content that we do that? Or that piece of correspondence? Um, another item I just want to bring to your attention is correspondence from the clerk assistant regarding. Um, engagement with marginalised groups. Um, if you're content, perhaps we would want to go back just to suggest that there may be issues with um, interaction with the likes of um, DVA, TransLink, maybe Northern Ireland Water, um, that they might wish to consider. Um, and it, it, I suppose whenever I looked at it, maybe it also prompted the fact that we had planned at an earlier stage to um, meet with the Consumer Council. So that may be something that we wish to um, 
to revisit and to um, programme into our, our forward work programme, if you can intend to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. Members, any other issues they wish to raise out of correspondence? Oh, Ms Anderson? That um, interference is coming through, even at our end, when our mics are, are muted. So I don't think it's coming from from anybody, maybe on the Zoom um, or the Starleaf. But just to say, to you, Chair, that um, in relation to the marginalised groups, um, I I didn't realise that the the clerks had such a form. I'm assuming that the Assembly Good Relations Plan that. This is something that's separate from, for instance, when I read that, I thought, is that a TEO issue around good relations? But I'm assuming that this is around the outreach and engagement that the Assembly does. Um, I'm not so sure that the uh, the groups that, that we have highlighted there would be regarded as marginalised, although I do think that the Consumer Council, that that, that would be a good organisation because it represents a lot of groups and people who are marginalised. So I would like to give a bit of thought uh, the committee to give a bit of thought uh, before we would sign off on any recommendation as to who we would um, recommend that they should engage with. Okay, if you, um, okay well, if you're content to give some consideration to that, I suppose in the broader round it was about um, how those organisations perhaps engaged with um, <coughs> those types of groups as well, just sort of to get some feedback from, from them, um, just as um, they're on the front line, and um, obviously issues will be raised directly with them. Okay. Well, maybe we will feed in if there's a group or organisation that we would like consideration to be given to. Okay. Um, Ms Kelly. I think, Chair, in, in infrastructure terms, one could argue that the rural community is a marginalised group, and therefore the likes of the rural community network you know, would be a good um, um, consultee or stakeholder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other comments with regards to correspondence? Okay, so are members content um, with the actions as suggested in the correspondence memo? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Moving then to item six, which is subordinate legislation, um, SL1s, which are not subject to assembly proceedings. At page 130, we have um, SL1, the Waiting Restrictions Macora Order Northern Ireland 2021. The proposal will introduce a new waiting at any time restriction on lengths of Bank Square in Macora. Proceedings, again, as I've suggested, are not um, subject to assembly proceedings. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, no, okay. If members wish to we'll pause for a second, just. What? Uh, uh, pronunciation from the city of What do you call it? Magiri? Depends the speed you're in. Members, if you're content, we're just waiting for the minister to arrive, so we'll just suspend for a couple of minutes. Okay, thank you. Program signed.
Maryland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. Okay, members, we're, we're back in, in session. Um, we're now going to receive a, a briefing from the Minister just with regards to an update on COVID-19 and also current issues. Um, you'll find at page 134, Ministerial Correspondence providing an update um, just in advance of the briefing. Um, the Minister has indicated that she'll be with us until around noon, um, so if that's still um, acceptable, that would, be, that would be good news for us. Um, so we can welcome um, the Minister, um, Nicola Mallon, um, Shan Kerr, who's the Director of Corporate Policy and Planning, and Jeremy Logan, uh, the Chief Executive of the Driver and Vehicle Agency. Um, you're all very welcome to the committee, and it's, it's nice to see you all in person as well, so um, thank you for for attending. Um, Minister, if you'd like to make an opening statement and then we'll follow up with some questions. Yes, um, thank you, Chair, and apologies because I had been advised and in my diary it said that the meeting, my presence was required at 10.30, so apologies if it was meant to be earlier. No, it's fine because normally we would have quite a lengthy correspondence agenda and this morning we didn't, so we were able to move through it quite quickly. Okay. Well, look, um, thank you, Chair, for the invitation to attend the committee today. Before turning to the issues which I outlined in my letter to the committee dated the 16th of April, I want to acknowledge and thank the staff across my department and in DVA, TransLink and Northern Ireland Water, who have continued to work exceptionally hard, often in very difficult circumstances, to deliver our critical public services. Together we have achieved a lot and I would like to take this opportunity to highlight some of the work that has been taken forward over the last number of months. 
Public transport is one of the areas under my remit which has overcome challenges and adapted to new ways of working to ensure that the services we deliver support our citizens and, where possible, the health service. The safety of our public transport customers and staff has been of the utmost importance to me. At the outset, I took the decision to introduce safer transport guidance for public transport operators and safety travel guidance for passengers, along with the introduction of mandatory face coverings on public transport and in public transport stations. Rates of compliance have increased significantly since then, with an average of 90% of passengers now wearing face coverings on TransLink services. I have also been working to support our health service throughout the pandemic. I implemented free travel on public transport for all health and social care staff, and TransLink has set up dedicated park and ride services for our health and social care staff to assist them accessing work. I have recently approved plans to assist the Health Trust with the Mass Vaccination Centre at the SSE Arena. These include a wide range of high-frequency TransLink services to ensure people can access the vaccination centre safely and in a timely manner, and from Belfast's east side and north side park and ride sites where we have suspended charges. Our community transport operators have also played a key role in the fight against COVID. And I was keen that we sustained our grant-funded community transport operators, enabling them to transition their services and provide additional subsidy to the Rathlin Island ferry operator to support their respective local communities. I have also made £1.36 million of funding available for a pilot of electric minibuses with the overall aim of assessing the feasibility of using electric vehicles for community transport while also increasing awareness of blue-green energy. As members will know, travel by rail is an issue I am very passionate about and I believe it has massive untapped potential to deliver multiple benefits across our island. Minister Eamon Ryan and I have formally announced an all-island strategic rail review. This review will allow us to consider the rail network across this island and how we can improve it. Whilst it reflects the commitments under New Decade New Approach to examine the feasibility of a high, higher speed rail link between Derry, Belfast, Dublin, Cork and Limerick, Minister Ryan and I are keen that we use this opportunity to consider how we can improve our rail network across the island. I believe that the completed review will inform investment decisions on our rail network across the island and provide a joined-up approach to ensure that investment achieves the maximum impact in future years for everyone. East-West partnership working across these islands is also important, and I continue to engage with and make representations to the British Government to honour the commitments made in New Decade New Approach to turbocharge infrastructure, including a high-speed rail link between Belfast, Dublin and Cork. I am also committed to providing safer routes that give people the freedom and confidence to walk and cycle as part of their everyday routine. I made a commitment in September last year to bring forward legislation to introduce part-time 20 miles per hour speed limits at around 100 schools across Northern Ireland so that parents children and staff will be safer as they go to and from school every day. Works are now fully completed at a number of schools, with signs operational, with the remaining schools in the programme due to be completed before the end of the school year. In June 2020, I announced the creation of the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund to act as a catalyst for positive infrastructure and cultural change in the way we live and travel. During the year, this fund has delivered £5 million investment, together with contributions from the Department for Communities and the Department for Environment, through the COVID-19 revitalisation programme. This has been invested across all council areas in green initiatives, enabling people to make short journeys by walking, wheeling and cycling, rather than travelling by car. We have also invested £2.4 million in greenway projects across four council areas, investment of £3.7 million on a range of interventions including foot and cycleways, pop-up cycle lanes, crossings and other cycle foot infrastructure and social distancing measures. 
£150,000 has been invested in flood prevention schemes at Forth River and Belfast Castle. And we have also procured electric vehicles to replace end-of-life petrol diesel vehicles within my department's fleet. In the coming year, we will continue to develop projects and programmes within the fund, including making funding available to councils for the greening of alleyways, and will launch a challenge fund to provide grant funding to voluntary and community sector organisations for blue-green objectives. I should say at this point, Chair, that I very much welcome the Committee's inquiry on decarbonising road transport. My department is working to identify actions to support the decarbonisation of transport and infrastructure services that will help to reduce carbon emissions and address the climate emergency. Since taking up office, I have been actively supporting the introduction of electric vehicles as part of my broader transport decarbonisation plans. I have been able to make changes to the planning system to provide permitted development rights to make it easier to expand the charging infrastructure for electric vehicles and have provided over £455,000 uh, of match funding for the FASTER project, which is to install a total of 73 EV rapid charging points across the island of Ireland and West Scotland by the 31st of March 2023. My department has also been engaging with ESB on its plans to replace approximately 70 charge points on the existing public network, and I will be considering how charging infrastructure can be funded here in the future, along with my executive colleagues. The pathway for the decarbonisation of transport will also require the introduction of a range of alternative fuels, including hydrogen fuel cell technology and compressed and liquefied natural gas for heavier vehicles. These areas are being explored as part of the work my department is taking forward to inform the Department for Economy's energy strategy and the development of UK-wide transport decarbonisation plans. Trialling of hydrogen fuel cell buses by TransLink began in December, and I am currently considering opportunities for the introduction of hydrogen technologies in other heavy goods vehicle sectors. A pilot scheme is also being taken forward to introduce electric vehicles into the department's operational fleet. The scheme, which will assess the suitability of electric vehicles to meet operational needs, and will initially see the purchase of two electric vans with a view to replacing other vehicles in our fleet with low emission vehicles in the future. The department is also working to reduce diesel emissions from the Strangford ferry service entering the environment. Turning to private coach and bus operators, with the pandemic continuing, I recognise that these businesses, like many others, are still dealing with an extremely difficult situation. I am pleased to have delivered support uh, to the tune of £2.7 million to 105 eligible operators through my department's first support fund, which closed just before Christmas. The evidence presented to my department confirmed the ongoing impact on the sector and following a further determination and designation by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, a second financial assistance scheme was delivered, providing support for the period between 1 October 2020 and 31 March 2021. In designing this second scheme, I listened to feedback from the sector and incorporated a number of their proposals. Applications under the second scheme are being processed as quickly as possible. I remain committed to doing everything I can to assist the sector during these difficult times, and my officials will continue to maintain contact with them. As with the private bus and coach sector, COVID-19 has caused a significant and long-lasting impact on taxi drivers. In recognition of the challenges faced by the sector, I acted swiftly at the onset of the pandemic to put in place a number of regulatory easements amounting to over £1 million of support. In addition, when new powers were granted to my department by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, two financial assistance schemes have been provided for taxi drivers, together providing some £15.5 million of financial support to our taxi drivers. I am pleased to be able to confirm that following the Executive's decision on the 15th of April to relax certain COVID-19 restrictions, driving instruction, theory testing and practical driving tests can resume on April 23rd with appropriate mitigations in place. Driver theory testing will resume at the six established test centres with additional test slots at each location and extended opening hours to help address the increased demand. 
An additional temporary test centre, which will be located in Ballymena, will also be opened that can provide around 1,000 test slots per week. Practical driving tests will also resume from Monday, the 23rd of April. Those candidates whose driving tests were cancelled from the 17th to the 22nd of April have been directly contacted by the DVA and provided with the opportunity to reschedule their appointments. The booking system for new customers will open in three phases, with phases one and two prioritising groups of customers for a limited period whose theory tests are due to expire, after which it will be opened for all other customers in phase three. The booking system for Phase 1 customers whose theory test pass certificates will expire by the 31st of October 2021 will open from the 26th of April. The booking system for Phase 2 customers whose theory test pass certificates will expire between the 1st of November 2021 and the 31st of March 2022 will then open from the 4th of May. The DBA is set to reopen the booking service for all other customers in mid-May, and they will issue further communications through NI Direct and social media channels and write to all approved driving instructors to confirm the process and the exact date. To help meet the expected high demand for driving tests, the DBA has taken a range of measures to maximise the availability of test slots, including the recruitment of additional examiners, and the provision of new temporary test centres. They will continue to offer driving tests on Saturdays and at certain centres on Sundays where it is suitable to do so without compromising the integrity of the test. The DVA is also actively liaising with the Department of Health to consider the facilitation of priority requests if they are identified by employers from key workers whose jobs are ancillary to medical health or social care services and who are required to drive for the purposes of their work. It will be for the relevant employers to contact the agency directly to identify their staff that fall within this priority group, and the DBA will then endeavour to facilitate priority appointments for both theory and practical driving tests where possible. Chair, with your agreement, I do not intend to go into the detail in my opening statement on the A5, given it was discussed widely at an adjournment debate yesterday evening, at which a number of committee members were present and contributed. But I would like to turn to the York Street Interchange project. You will be aware, Chair, that I commissioned a short, sharp review of the York Street Interchange project prior to deciding on the next steps for the scheme. This work has been completed, and I have accepted all six recommendations of the independent review, which relate to placemaking and the scheme's alignment with emerging policies, an assessment of impact and benefits, and communications and coordination. I have asked officials to commission further work, particularly around placemaking, and to maximise ambition in terms of what can be delivered for communities, connectivity, and the wider living places agenda from this really important scheme. The work will also take into account the further development of the bolder vision for Belfast to reimagine how the city will look and feel in the future, and I have asked the consultants to report in the autumn. I remain committed to the implementation of this scheme, and I want to ensure that it is advanced in the right way for those who will use it, those who live around it, and that it is future-proofed. Turning now to water, which is critical for our public health, for enabling economic growth and increasing our housing supply. Northern Ireland Water has continued to deliver its essential services throughout the pandemic, despite a reduction in income due in part to less demand from non-domestic sector. I requested additional funding from the Executive to address the shortfall and was provided with £32.5 million of additional resource funding during the June and October monitoring rounds. In addition to the additional resource funding, my department successfully secured an extra £15 million to accelerate those Northern Ireland water capital projects which were delayed during the first half of the pandemic. Members will be aware that I also published the draft Strategic Drainage Infrastructure Plan for Belfast entitled Living with Water in Belfast for public consultation in November. I am aware that officials are attending this committee next week to provide details of the consultation responses, but I am delighted to give members an early indication that the vast majority of responses were extremely positive and embraced the integrated approach to drainage and wastewater management at the heart of the plan. 
As the committee is aware, the planning system also has a critical role in supporting our future economic and societal recovery from the pandemic. I have recently made legislation to further extend the temporary removal of the requirement for public events as part of the pre-application process for major planning applications to the 30th of September 21. This is an essential step that will continue to facilitate significant major planning applications across the region. If legislation had not been implemented, it may have resulted in the application process being invalid, leading to a backlog of major applications which would hinder our economic recovery after COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. Public participation, however, remains an important part of the planning process. To ensure that this is not compromised, the published advice and guidance on appropriate measures to replace face-to-face -face public events, such as online engagement, has been updated and remains in place. To conclude, Chair, as members know, I established a ministerial advisory panel on infrastructure to consider how an infrastructure commission for Northern Ireland might support more effectively the long-term planning and development of relevant infrastructure here. The committee will be aware of the overwhelming support among the business community, industry and the environment sector for an infrastructure commission and that I have been engaging with executive colleagues to consider how we might establish an infrastructure commission to support the long-term planning and delivery of infrastructure, particularly in the context of our recovery from COVID-19. And I am hopeful we as an executive can find agreement on the way forward. I hope, Chair, that members have found this update helpful and informative. Overall, I consider that our recovery from the pandemic is an opportunity to focus on supporting our local communities by creating places which are cleaner, healthier and more attractive for people to live, work and spend time in. We should grasp all of the opportunities to do so and work collaboratively where we can to ensure the best outcome for all of our citizens across Northern Ireland. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, and I think really on behalf of the committee, and we have done this several times, we need to pass on our thanks to all the frontline staff within um, the, within the department um, and TransLink, Northern Ireland Water, DVA as well, and the and challenges that they have, have been presented with, and of course continue to um, as, as we move through the, this very difficult time. Um, I suppose one issue that you didn't address was in relation to budget. And I appreciate that we are going to be having a, a briefing from officials um, after you leave. But there is a very clearly an imbalance between resource and capital moving into 21-22, which are going to have significant impact on, on, on what can be achieved during the next period of time. Um, perhaps you might wish to address that and how that is likely to impact on the department and what action you'll, you'll take accordingly. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, and I understand that officials are briefing you immediately after my session here on the budget. Um, the budget in terms of capital this time round is looking healthy, um, but in, for us to be able to deliver on that, it does require additional resource. Uh, and so that does present a challenge, as you have rightly highlighted. While the resource allocation is a cash term increase, in real terms it is a cut when you factor in inflation. So it certainly will be a very challenging environment and will you know, lead to a number of constraints in terms of the services that the department can provide. Services you know, like grass cutting, uh, gullies, things that are hugely important to citizens. So I've been engaging with my officials. We're trying to work through iterations uh, of different options to ensure that I can and try to make the best decisions possible under these difficult circumstances but I don't think there's any doubt that it will be extremely challenging and there will be constraints probably more constraints this time around in terms of in-year funding that may be available because of the consequences of the pandemic not just for my department uh, but to be fair across all departments okay and at what point will you be will you be much clearer as to what that's going to look like for the department with regards to decision making well I would hope um, within the next two weeks or so we've had a number of meetings to work through and went on some additional information coming from my officials um, to enable me to be able to make the, the right decision. So I'm very keen to be able to have allocations in place to give the certainty certainly that my officials need as well moving forward. Okay, uh, and I was very conscious that, um, that Jeremy is here and the very live issue of, yeah. of driving tests and the, the anxiety that is around that and the fact that this has been, um, been part of the restrictions for su such a considerable period of time. And we have spoken at length in previous um, discussions ar around um, the, the backlog and the likely backlog 
um, that will be created as a consequence of this. Um, and I appreciate that there, there's a phased approach to it. Um, are you in a position to know um, how many people obviously are, are, are currently in waiting for their test, whether that will, they will all be um, able to have their tests before um, May, whenever you open up for, for broader booking? Um, and is there the danger of creating a further backlog with um, theory tests um, opening in advance of that? Yeah, if I, I take first and then hand over um, to Jeremy. Um, Jeremy can work through the details of the phase one and phase two, but we have tried to work it, and I have to pay tribute to DVA uh, officials. They've been working very hard in this and liaison with colleagues across the islands in terms of managing um, expectations, but making sure that we're learning from other places. So the timeline that we're presenting, we feel will be enough to ensure that we can deal with the priority one and priority two before we move up out to the mid-May opening up for all of our, of our customers. But obviously we will continue to monitor that extremely closely and we have put in a number of additional capacity measures in place, whether test centres, additional examiners, extended opening hours and so forth. So we're constantly monitoring that to ensure that we're maximising our capacity um, because the overriding thing for me here is to minimise the disruption to our customers because this public facing service has been closed for so long. In respect of the, of the theory tests, it does present a challenge and, and Jeremy can come in, but we felt that um, we needed to move on, on all three element, elements of it at once. I mean, people are equally frustrated that they can't get a theory test. So it's about trying to, as best we can, help all of those customers, which is why we, we didn't hold back on, on the theory test. We're just trying to manage the resumption of the theory test and the practical driving test in the one go. I don't know if you want to come in on any I think that I, suppose that I suppose what raised that question for me was the fact that you'd said about the temporary test centre, which of course will be welcomed in Ballymena, but the fact that there's a thousand tests per week, which then obviously then adds to the accumulation of those who are going to be waiting for practical tests. Yeah, I suppose naturally theory tests and driving tests in normal circumstances would uh, run alongside each other and there would be a, a, a natural in, uh, you know, balance in, in normal, um, normal times. And clearly these aren't normal times and we estimate that there's approximately 22,000 um, people category B uh, car, private car driving uh, theory tests that are valid and that will be uh, in some cases looking for a, a driving test. So that's why we have broken it down into the phases and we estimate there's about 8,600 in this, those first two phases that will be offered uh, an appointment in the next couple of weeks. Firstly, we had to cancel those tests um, that were in the system between the 17th and the 22nd of April. Uh, there's approximately 230 uh, that were in that group, and we wrote to those individuals uh, directly through email, um, text message or, or letter to confirm that their tests had been cancelled and give them the opportunity to rebook their test before it opens up for the Phase 1 customers, which will happen from next Monday. Um, there are also um, folks that had their tests booked for on the Friday and the Saturday, and there's a small number of those. Now, we have offered them the chance to go ahead with that, those tests. However, where they feel that they need further instruction, we have also offered them the opportunity to cancel those tests and, and reschedule. And we believe that um, with the, the steps that we have taken, we will have capacity for the Phase 1 and Phase 2 customers to book tests between now and the end of July, where we have opened up slots across all our test centres, and we will monitor that situation very, very you know, closely over the next couple of weeks before we then release the, the, the final phase and open it up for all customers. Um, we anticipate that not everyone in the first two phases will want to take a driving test, so that's the bit that we'll have to keep a careful watch on to make sure that we have capacity across our network. And indeed, we've put in place um, a number of additional examiners to, to assist with, with the driving tests, and uh, we've identified four temporary test centres in Belfast, Cookstown, Coleray and, and Oma, which will be ready to commence driving tests from the middle of May. Okay, so you're, you're confident that you can you can manage sort of those who are in the system at the moment, um, then po post May or yeah post May really whenever um, those who have received their test or, uh, they passed their te their theory test then between those sort of few weeks then that will obviously accumulate and and, and create. A well. As I suppose in, simple per in normal terms, we would deliver about 3,900 uh, category P B tests a month, and we've probably had around 10 months over the last 12 months where there has been no testing at all, so there's no question uh, there's going to be a demand there. 
um, our uh, goal is to maximise the amount of resource and to exceed the 3,900 tests mm -hmm. to start to eat into that demand or that backlog, as you, you might call it, to try and clear those people waiting for a test as quickly as we possibly can. And how many um, theory tests are normally taken then per week? Theory tests per week. Um, I don't know that I have those figures in front of me. The additional, we have the six centres that the minister talked about, and those centres are, are generally open sort of uh, Monday to Friday and indeed Saturdays. We're extending the hours of opening for them uh, so that we can create um, you know, more theory tests. And the minister rightly says there is a demand for theory tests as well as, as the driving tests themselves. And this additional. Uh, 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 additional centre at Ballymena will be able to accommodate about a thousand tests per week, um, which we hope will be coming in in, in in the middle of May. And as I say, normally there would be a natural equilibrium between those people passing their theory tests and coming forward for driving tests, and, and that's the, the goal that we want to get back to, to achieving that, uh, and that sort of normal model of, of behaviour. I suppose the other additional factor is that people haven't been able to avail of official driving instruction either, and so that will have an impact in terms of people who have passed their theory test and have had their theory test certificate extended, but obviously they will want to have additional time because they haven't been able to engage in weekly instruction, so that will also be a contributory factor in terms of, kind of the time frames that are involved. Certainly people will have to wait. Uh, much longer than they would have had to wait pre-COVID. <coughs> our goal here is not just to, to meet the level that we were pre-COVID. We're trying to provide additional capacity beyond that so that we're meeting demand as it would have been pre-COVID, but we're also able to eat into that backlog um, as well. Okay, and that's a good segue to my next question, which was in relation to driving instructors, and it was an issue that we raised before um, in the fact that a, a number of driving instructors have obviously left the industry, be that through ill health, retirement and so on, and it's those replaced, those who are able then to be able to replace them. Uh, and there were some concerns with regards to them having access um, to, um, to tests to become sort of certified instructors. Um, you had suggested at the last, the, our last conversation there, there may be some flexibility with regards to that, but it may require legislation for extending the validity of um, their qualifying period for yeah. instruction. That's right, and, and the minister has actually just agreed to a submission to extend the qualifying period from two years to three years for those uh, driving instructors that haven't been able to avail of their qualification. That uh, legislation should be made in, in May and allow uh, an additional year for them to complete their instruction. Now, it's relatively small numbers, but I think that will be helpful for the industry and welcomed by the industry. Okay, and, and obviously their tests are about, take a bit longer, so has that been sort of worked in that they will have availability to be able to yeah. um, access? All, all driving test categories will resume from the 23rd, so I mean, I've talked about you know category, category B, the private car test, but there will obviously be lorries, buses, those qualifying tests, they will all commence and they will be managed at a, you know, at a local level with the, with the test centre managers and their teams to make sure that they have the appropriate resources available to deliver those tests. Okay, thank you. And just another question for me, just in relation to road maintenance and obviously the proliferation of, of potholes, and it's a very topical issue. Um, and, and worryingly, whenever officials came to us in, in February, they highlighted that there was a workforce capacity, um, and this was, this was an issue throughout the department, particularly in relation to design capacity. Um, um, having lost around a third of the staff as a consequence of VES and 15% then of other staff. Um, and this was obviously having an impact then on their ability then to be able to spend late money as it became available. And, and I suppose we could talk all day around the issue around single year budgets and the difficulties around planning for that. But what efforts are being made to address the, the workforce issue? And I'm thinking that alongside the implications um, for a substantial swathe of Northern Ireland, Hey, which is obviously um, being caught with regards to the issues around um, resurfacing contracts. Um, and, and just to get a steer from you as to how that challenge is going to be addressed over the next few months. Okay, thank you. Yes, as you say, the, the VES has had a significant impact on staffing resource right across the civil service. Um, we have 2,991 staff in post and we have 418 vacancies at present, which equates with around 14 percent of the workforce. Um, the department is working with the Northern Ireland um, Civil Service HR to complete and fulfil those vacancies as quickly as possible. Um, but there is the issue of affordability, and Chair, you touched on the difficulties in the resource budget. Um, and so it's trying to fulfil all of those vacancies, which will require a resource 
um, budget, while at the same time making sure that we have the resource to be able to then provide the services. So certainly it's something that the Department is very aware of, um, and we're working very closely with the civil service HR to try to ensure that we can fulfil the vacancies as, as quickly uh, as possible. I think that's hugely important. On the issue of the um, resurfacing contracts, I mean, you'll be aware that um, there are uh, legal actions um, in place. Um, we have received, I think it's um, a writ of summons issued on behalf of three of the unsuccessful um, tenders. Um, but the department is working very closely with the departmental solicitor's of office um, and we're progressing options for addressing this in the most expeditious way. I just want to assure you that in regards to my department's resurfacing programme, those schemes were planned um, for this financial year. Well, the financial year just passed um, and the affected contract areas have already been completed. Um, and so the um, minor works will be carried out. Um, that won't be impacted because that can be carried out through existing contracts. But certainly officials are working uh, with senior legal advisors to make sure that we can address this and overcome this as quickly um, as possible. But whenever you say as quickly as possible, do you have an idea of how long that might be? I don't ha have a time frame at present, um, but we continue to work with legal advisors. I've made it clear, I was briefed on this, that we need to get this resolved um, as quickly uh, as possible. Um, and that's what officials are working to try to do. Thank you, Mr Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Minister Jeremy and Sean there. Um, thank you for your responses so far. I don't want to suppose dwell too long on the, um, the driving test bit, but you referred to the 22,000 number of sort of theory test backlog. And, what percentage increase are you going to get to eat into those? And I don't want to dwell on that all too long, but I'm concerned that the amount of people there, you're going to start up a new theory test coming forward. So what percentage increase of driving tests are you going to get, Jeremy, to eat into that backlog? I suppose if the parent interest of my daughter is not just on that list, trying to get on with it. Yeah, no, I, I fully understand. Um, I think we all find ourselves in positions where we have family members in, in this uh, predicament. Uh, really, I say the 3,900 figure we'll be talking about category B tests. Our expectation is that we will exceed that uh, certainly in the first month, and as the resources become available in new centres, um, I would like to think that we will be able to exceed that. Um, I am reluctant to put a number on it because it it, it obviously re, you know results in a lot of factors in terms of uh, you know the staff that come forward, the availability you know of the staff and working th through overtime, which uh, let's face it is, is is voluntary in some respects, and the f freeing up the dual role uh, examiners to to do that. Um, we have um, made many plans. I would estimate that we could exceed that you know by at least you know a thousand you know tests per month, um, but. That would be relatively conservative at this stage, um, uh, and we, we would certainly um, do our best to maximise that resource. I would say we are going to continue to release monthly, um, you know, statistical reports. Um, April's will probably not show it because it'll only be the first week of the resumption of service. So I think May's report will be a good indicator of how many tests that we can deliver across the network uh, in that period. Uh, and I say I would be confident that we will exceed that 3,900. Okay, moving on then to MOTs, what, where's that sort of sit now then? I think the last time, correct, Jeremy talked about that. Was there 70% capacity? Is that the right figure? Or was it 30? I can't remember what, one of the two figures you. you I think after, uh, uh, before MOTs. Christmas, we were operating at around 30% yeah. capacity, and then after Christmas, we sort of increased that to around 50%. Yeah. Now, the statistics that um, have just been published for, for March show that we actually were up around sort of, you know, over 70%. Um, that is to do with a number of factors, and that we opened all our test centres on Mondays and, and the bank holidays during that period. Um, there was some pressure on the demand. Um, um, some of that related to the, the lift issues of last year, and the minister agreed to extend the temporary exemption periods for another four months for cars between four and, 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 and uh, you know nine years old, and that has had a, you know a very beneficial impact on us being able to manage the capacity at our test centres. So we had a, a difficult period uh, for a few weeks, and we say we put on those additional hours, and now that seems to be settling down now. So we are in a you know a, a steady state. Being able to manage the MOT position, and our focus over the last few weeks has been obviously in freeing up as much resource as we can then to do the driving tests um, in the next couple of months. Okay, there's a minister. There's a point in here, just in this in the paper regarding um, wastewater surveillance project. Pardon? 
a wastewater surveillance project oh, yes. monitoring COVID. Yep, yep. Maybe don't want to get into the details there, but if you explain sort of the, the bones of what that is. Yep. So um, we have been working with uh, with Darren. Obviously, um, my officials also sit in kind of a water stakeholder um, with with England, Scotland, and Wales as well. Um, and so it's about monitoring the water for kind of the presence of COVID. It's just again. Um, part of the armory in terms of having that evidential base and that monitoring about the prevalence uh, of COVID as well. So it was a, a, an initiative that my officials have been working with across the water. Um, but I'm happy to provide additional details to committee members on that if you'd like. So is that is that actually wastewater? Do you, your, yep. What are you monitoring? Yes, wastewater. Fair enough. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Just then to pick up on the chair's point regarding roads maintenance. And I suppose I want to pay tribute. I missed the opportunity of paying tribute to Tracy Bratton, who's moved now from Cookstown across Doma. And some of your colleagues, to be fair, probably most of them, does a very good job, a very good working relationship with, with myself. Um, have you concerns that that capital budget will not be delivered this year due to the contract issues? Have you any concerns at that? And I understand they've got a lot more money than they normally have, with a bigger percentage to spend. So do you have any concerns that they'll not be actually spend it this financial year due to that contract issue? Um, uh, well, that's not what I've been advised from my officials. I've been advised certainly that this is a challenge, um, but I'm not being advised that you know I should be very concerned about the, this issue. Um, but it is something that I'm I'm closely monitoring, and and I just would like to say uh, the thank you for your comments around Tracy at the adjournment debate that you very kindly brought on on SIDS and school safety, and uh, like think all members paid tribute, and I think that's important because. You know, our frontline workers are living in their communities. They want, they don't want potholes in their communities. They want to see vast improvements. And it, because these are issues that really matter to people, they cause huge frustrations. And sometimes it's our frontline staff that get bear the brunt of that. So I want to say thank you for the continual expressions of support and appreciation from members of the committee, because I know that it makes a big difference to our staff. It really does lift their morale. So thank you. And I think it's important, Minister, you hear it suppose directly from us. That roads maintenance, rural roads, is what we hear day and daily. It's our number one issue, and it's, it's not to be rude to you, but it's important that you get that message from our constituents. Don't lose focus on that, no. and, and, and make sure there's plenty of finance getting into that because all our things are very important. But people see in that day and daily. No, I, I completely agree, and that's why I was very clear in setting up the Rural Roads Fund. And you know, as I said to the chair, we're working through kind of, you know, my thinking. But my intention would be, if it is possible, I would like to increase the Rural Roads Fund because I am very mindful of the impact of you know potholes and others, particularly in our rural areas where people are more reliant on their own vehicles to get them from A to B. So it is something that I'm very conscious of, and I would like to do more in. Okay, and, and just. I'm Two quick points, Chair, for me. Regarding the additional schools, obviously we talked about the 100 schools that you've da done. Yeah. Have you any more update on where you go with the future ones? And I'm, I'm in conversation with Mr Porter regarding some further plans he wants to do and some testing, should I say. Yep. Have you any more to tell us on those additional schools and is that your plan going forward? Yes. So we were able to um, roll out the 20 miles per hour part time uh, scheme to 103 schools in Northern Ireland. Um, and I'm very keen that we roll it out further. I suppose the extent to which we were able to do that will be dependent um, on the budget. There was two million set aside uh, the just financial year just passed it out. So I am very committed to do it. I suppose the extent in terms of the number of schools that we can include in the second tranche will be dependent on the budget allocation, but I'm very keen. I think this is a great scheme. Um, household surveys um, all prove that the vast majority of people believe that we should have 20 miles per hour outside our schools. It's an issue that members right across the House bring to my attention on community groups. So it's an area that I want to do to do much more in as well. And I suppose it's just the, the numbers of schools involved in the second tranche will, will be, hopefully, we can confirm that soon. Okay, and one final question with question is probably not directly to be fair your responsibility, but I think it's important regarding littering on roads. Yeah. Obviously the whole your equipment's cutting the roads, you've a deer issue, you've a local council issue. Have you any thoughts on how we solve this problem? And how do you feed into that? Because obviously we're seeing big spring cleanups every day, communities are trying to help, but then the minorities doing the littering. So, so what's yep. your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is an issue, and I suppose it's it's how my department works to address it, working with the councils, which have a huge role in this, and also with local community groups. I think it's tremendous the way community groups have rallied around and do litter picks, but I think there's an issue here around education, yeah. and I think there's also a, an issue around enforcement. Yeah. 
um, the card and stick approach. So I actually think that this would merit, you know, an approach where you're bringing a number of stakeholders together to try to address that. Whether that's led by one of the organisations within the environment sector, I think, um, you know, as it keep keep NI tidy, or that one of those organisations could perhaps lead in that. Um, but I definitely think we need to put our heads together on this one. And I think, you know, the pandemic has also brought into sharp focus the amount of illegal dumping. That has gone on as well, which is a huge bite right across our, our countryside, and is an issue I know of great concern to communities right across Northern Ireland. Thank you, Minister. Thanks. Chair. Of course, fly tipping became a greater issue during COVID as well. Yeah. Thank you, um, Ms. Anderson. Um, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Minister, for, for the uh, presentation that you give to us today. I find it very, very informative. As you know, uh, Minister, I have been um, very keen. Uh, to, to hear particularly what, what was said with regards to rail and the infrastructure. And I do welcome what you said here today and also the announcement that was made about the All-Ireland Strategic Review of Rail. Could I ask you to elaborate uh, somewhat in relation to the time frame and uh, what does it mean for the current feasibility study, such as the Phase 3? And will the review be looking at extending the line outwards to places like Derry, Donegal, um, that has been starved, as you know, for rail uh, of rail for decades? Yeah, thank you. So, in terms of the All Island Strategic Rail Review, um, that has gone out to procurement. Um, that has to be completed within the 12 months. The terms of reference for that review are that it will examine the existing rail network to see where we can have improvements to existing. It will look to see where there are new opportunities for new rail links. It will have a focus on rail connectivity to our gateway, so our ports and airports in the island, and it will also examine freight. And the role that freight or the role that rail can provide in terms of the transportation of goods via rail, given you know the, the benefits that will be derived um, from for the climate in particular. Um, in respect of phase three, that's separate, um, Ms. Anderson. That's a feasibility study that I already gave a commitment to do, and so work on that is progressing. And my officials continue to meet with Into the West, as do I. Um, to make sure that we can get that feasibility study um, completed. Um, and I think it's very important that we address the lack of connectivity into the North West uh, as a region, but also the wider island piece as well. Okay, I'll, and I'll keep my eye on all of that as it's unfolding. Um, I have a number of questions, Minister, so forgive me. I'll try and get through them as quick as I can. Uh, we just had a discussion at the committee earlier around the bus and, and taxi and coach operators and the support. And as you would know, uh, I've raised this on many occasions with regards to the support schemes. And many in the industry, in the different sectors of the industry, they, they are very concerned about the fact that some of them endured a lot of cost in their applications associated with the plan. For instance, some of them had to hire uh, an accountant, and then they're looking at sort of 1.5 million, I believe, of these schemes that was made available was handed back. And for many of them that did that, for instance, in the coach operators, um, they then were deemed ineligible. And then we have the taxi operators who, um, after consultation with the department um, and, and your officials and yourself, were told that they can apply for the C or BSS scheme, uh, even though um, that they were really asking for a sector specific scheme and now they find themselves with very little uh, of the operators actually benefiting from that scheme so is, are these issues issues that you are constantly looking at and do you intend to revisit them Thank you for that. I suppose the issue for the accountancy um, provision that fell to the ta or to the bus and coach operators that wasn't a requirement for the taxi scheme. No. Um, and uh, the first scheme there was about two point seven million pound paid out in the first scheme for the private bus and coach operators. We estimate that the second scheme will cost will probably provide about three million pound in support. So that's just under six million pound. As I said, the taxi scheme, uh, the first and second, uh, we were able to provide support of 15.5 million pound to, to the taxi scheme. And in the second bus and operator scheme, I was very conscious of the representations around lifting the 100,000 pound cap which we did. It's very mindful that some of the operators have brought to our attention some of their concerns around state aid rules and how that might be restrictive. And we gave a commitment to look at that. And then another issue that they'd raised about the need for improved communication. So we addressed that in the in the second scheme as well. Uh, there is no doubt that the industries continue to experience difficulties. They're very reliant on the hospitality sector and the retail sector. And while it's very welcome that we're moving into a period of easements, that still will present challenges. The executive has yet 
to have, um, have made decisions or given clear indications of the financial support that we are going to be providing to different sectors. Um, in the next financial year, there is money in the centre. The Finance Minister has made that clear. Um, but I will continue to work with the sectors and to work with executive colleagues to ensure that we can continue to provide support to those um, who, um, who need it. I think, is there another question in there? I may have forgotten. No, no, uh, Minister, it's something that we as a committee are going to look at because we're, we're receiving correspondence from many in the scheme. And whilst obviously they're looking at support going forward, they're looking at the support that was currently made available and some of them ended up um, having a burden of additional cost and not being made eligible. I think this is something that the committee will come back to you on in relation to all of that. Could I ask you, Minister, in relation to the A2 Bunkrana Road? Um, I've already had correspondence. We've engaged with you uh, with regards to this in the city. You know that there is a desperate need to detach the roundabout of Fort George to ensure that the investment and the development at Fort George uh, takes place. Now, like the, the shocking decision, I think, in relation to another public inquiry in the A5, and you do, you, I know you don't want to open that up because there was a debate yesterday uh, in, in the Assembly on that, and that's going to be an ongoing issue, but the A2 is probably going to end up with a public inquiry as well. So what we are trying to do in the city is make sure that that area, um, in terms of because of all the development that's happening in Fort George, that the two things that are in, impacting on Fort George is really related to your department. One is in relation to the roundabout of Fort George, and that needing to be detached from the overall A2 scheme, but not, you know, not in any way separate from it, that it's not complementary to the scheme whenever it would be done. And then the other issue is, is the Craigan Reservoir. As you know, we as a committee, we had from officials from the River Agency, we had um, um, a confidential briefing in relation to reservoirs, so I'll not go into any or all of that. But you know, in the Craigan Reservoir, there's 720,000 is needed to the work relating to health and safety. Thankfully, we got from the Department of Communities, Deidre Hargi, a commitment that she will make a contribution, Minister Hargi, of 250 million. And I know your officials met with the council yesterday, and I'm hoping that the same kind of contribu uh, contribution could come from your department too, so that we could get that work done and it doesn't impact on the development of Fort George. Thank you um, for that. Um, first of all, just in relation to the A5, it isn't a new public inquiry. We've had to reconvene. Well, we will be reconvening next year because it was an interim report. Um, in respect of the, the roundabout, I know that you have made representations on that and I've asked officials to look at that. In respect um, of the reservoirs, um, I don't know if the committee is aware, but um, the executive office has signed off on the transfer of functions order, so that will now start to commence. I think it's just a timetabling issue which will help in in terms of the, the situation going forward. Uh, and as you said, Ms. Anderson, my officials met with the councils yesterday. So, you know, we are looking to see what we can do to support reservoir um, owners and reservoir managers to make sure that we can have development, but we can do so in a safe in a safe way. So there is progress being made in that respect in terms of the legislation. And I've also asked my officials to be working up options for the secondary legislation um, as well. The transfer of function order, as you know, I've been uh, keen to, to see that taken forward and we are glad that that is signed off and that is moving forward. But we need some dedicated support with regards to the, the work that needs done now. Um, as opposed to waiting on the transfer of function taking place so that we have asked for your department, the Department of Communities um, and Council to come together with a cocktail of funding. But maybe that is something you can go back to your officials from the meeting yesterday and see about taking that forward. Minister, you mentioned um, in January, I think you said that you were on track to, uh, to ensure that the A6 phase two uh, will be de delivered by 2022. Um, as we know, the, the A6 has been going on for many, many years, and uh, we in Derry are very keen to see about taking that forward. Can I ask you if that time frame is still in existence, as that's what we're looking to, um, 2022? And can I ask you about the remediation work at Maboy, if that's being dealt with so that it doesn't hinder that section of the A6? Thank you. Yes, I can assure you um, that we are still on track. While there was some impact from COVID in the initial period of the pandemic, um, I have, because I actually saw uh, an update on this uh, as recently as this week, and so we're on track for the 2022 um, time frame. Uh, in respect of my boy, you'll be aware of the difficulties there and around design, so officials are continuing to, to work on that and happy to provide you with a further update on that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to that update. The last thing, and then asking the nature for sewage, 
uh, as you know, I've been saying, um, like others, you know, uh, no drains, no cranes. Yeah. And the one thing that I would like to ask you about, Minister, is in relation to a trial period that I understand has been carried out in one of the in Belfast wastewater treatment plants about oxygen being used to help and the treatment of wastewater. Now, my understanding is that the Comore in Derry, the wastewater treatment plant in Comore, would have been a more effective plant uh, in terms of the size and output. And the, the option that, uh, that, was, that it ended up anyway, it's in the trial period in, in Belfast. Um, can I ask you in relation to Comore in Derry, if the wastewater treatment plant can be considered now as a, as a further option of rolling this out, if that is what the trial period shows that it is effective, because I think the size of the Clamore uh, wastewater treatment plant would have been a better option uh, for, for this to be trialled. Yes, um, so we're, we'll have to wait the findings of, of this trial, but if it proves to be successful in our views that it will be successful on a number of fronts, then we would be keen to roll it out across the wastewater infrastructure. The Party X pilot has been funded by the Department for Economy, um, but certainly I'm happy to feedback to see um, you know, why Belfast was picked, given the issues that you've just raised there around Culmore. Um, but I would be very keen, if this proves to be successful, that we do roll it out across other uh, wastewater treatment works. I appreciate, Minister, if you could make that representation. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to come back to you about it because I won't ask you to delve on it today. It's about Craigavon Bridge, Bird Fowlin. There's a health and safety issue. We need it cleaned up. We're saying put a falcon on the bridge. This is disgusting, not, not just disgusting, but it really is, as I said, a health and safety issue for people who are walking along that bridge. So I will engage with your officials to see if we can get it cleaned up. Yeah, and officials have been engaging with the council on this issue um, as well. So I think it's again putting our heads together to see how we can try to address this issue. Okay, Minister, thank you very much. It's all about dairy for me. Stand up for dairy. <laughs> well, thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to the ministers for, for our update this morning. Um, Minister, I have just a couple of things. I suppose one of the key ones for me is around the road safety strategy and, and the 20 mile zones outside schools, which will be no surprise. Um, obviously, as you know, the department was expected to publish a new strategy um, to go out to consultation, and, and it has faced um, unforeseen delays. Um, I think it was to published in March, but um, there's been no word of it to my knowledge yet, anyhow. Um, it's just, I suppose, latest reports have shown there's been a 55% reduction from um, the baseline figures in, in 2004 until 2008 of fatalities on the road um, compared to the 2020 uh, strategy target of a 60% reduction. So I was just wondering um, if you can advise when we can expect to see the new road strategy um, and what targets and outcomes have you been looking at? Because I think we really do need a, a very robust a new strategy to get us to the road to zero. Um, and I suppose I'll just I'll, I'll give you my second question on that because it's, it's kind of all under the one umbrella uh, of road safety. But as, as you know, Minister, the, the 20 mile zones outside schools is a very important issue to me. And it is it was really good to see it rolled out last year. However, I suppose with 100 schools being in limit, there's, there's many, more, many more schools want to be included, particularly in my, in my own area. I think there was only one or two included in the original list. So just to see if there's any further update on, on the rollout of that scheme as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in terms of kind of the road safety, um, there has been um, an extension to that. The team that would, were working on that were the team that then were taken to focus in on design and delivery of the two financial assistance schemes um, for the taxi drivers and the two financial assistance schemes for the coach and bus operators. So that has had an impact, um, but work is ongoing at that. It will be outcomes based um, to align with the PFG uh, and officials are working at that in pace because we recognise the importance of it. But I do want to assure you that even while work has been ongoing on the strategy, you will know about the actions have taken to introduce increased penalty points and tougher fines for people who are using their mobile phone while driving. They have also removed the statutory option uh, for those who we suspect are drink driving who can delay a, a blood or urine test uh, as an attempt to avoid um, prosecution. So we've addressed that. I'm also working with the PSNI, very keen in making representations to the Home Office so that we get that updated um, and modern breathalyzing uh, technology as well, which I would think will help, as you say, the 20 miles per hour outside schools. And then obviously we have a very prolific you know, campaign around raising awareness through a re range of mediums and inner schools and also ongoing energy solutions as well. So I want to assure you that officials 
you know, while there has been an impact from COVID on this piece of work in terms of the road safety strategy, it's of huge importance to us, uh, and we have been trying to make progress around a number of action points, um, and we would hope to be in a position um, within the next few months to be able to produce the updated um, road safety strategy. Um, in respect of the 20 miles per hour outside schools, I suppose we had to have a limit on it because we needed to make it practical in order to make it work, which is why we had arrived at the 100 schools in, in this financial year just passed. Um, but as I said to Mr Buchanan, you know, I'm very committed to this. Um, I think it delivers multiple benefits and I would like to do more. So I am committed to rolling it out on further to other schools across Northern Ireland. And we're just working through the budget to see how many schools we can include in the, in the second tranche. Okay, thank you, um, in, in terms of the, the road safety strategy, and it's just a couple of things really, it's more comment than, than question, but recently I done a meeting with the uh, Newry Morn uh, Road Safe Committee, who you, you will be um, familiar with, some of the members of it, and we had a really good discussion of some of the ideas and some of the work that they're doing at a local level, um, and they do a lot of education um, going into schools, they're producing resources, so I think it would be good for the department to, to engage with, with um, groups like that. Who are doing really, really good work on the ground um, and, and have lots of ideas as well. So it's, it's just a, a thought okay. on that one. Um, Minister, the other thing is just around some of the, the major projects in my own area. Firstly, um, is the Narrow Water Bridge. And I know officials were looking at the options for the bridge design. Um, can you give us any update on the progress on this and any detail, I suppose, over the, the current favourite options? Um, do we have any and do we have any indications when um, construction is likely to begin on that? Yeah, thank you. Just in respect of, of the first point that you made, um, the officials engage with a range of road safety partners. I think that's really important. I think that's one of the benefits of the road safety grant, for example. Um, local communities kind of know what works best uh, in terms of trying to promote the road safety message. So always keen to listen to those partners and to work positively with them. Um, in respect of the of Narrow Water Bridge, I recently met with both of the councils in the area. Um, we uh, took uh, took views upon from them in terms of the, the opening bridge or not, uh, as you'll be aware of. Um, and I'm also engaging closely with Minister Eamon Ryan and with the, the Taoiseach on this. Um, I think we're trying to look to see what are the best options for taking this forward. But I gave a commitment that I will go back to meet with the, both councils um, in the area to give them a progress report. Um, after the summer. So very keen to get progress in this and very keen to work with the Shared Island Fund um, in terms of financing it as well. I think it's, it is a transformative project. I think it will bring huge benefits to the locality in terms of the local economy, a real boost to tourism um, as well. So very keen to continue working with all stakeholders to make this happen. It is an NDNA commitment as well. So I think it's, it's proper that we honour that commitment that has been made to the people uh, who live in and around our water bridge, and I think even to the wider island, I think it's hugely important. Yeah, I know that's right. And I suppose then on a similar vein would be the Southern Relief Road. And I, and I know, um, particularly for Newry, the, the issue around it being a lifting bridge, you know you know yourself, the amount of times I've raised this in the chamber, that we are very much in favour of a lifting bridge, particularly because of the fear that it cut off that Albert Basin um, you know the Albert Basin site, and as you as you know, we're we're developing the city park for Newry, and all of that are interlinked. So it was to see if there's any update on any of that as well. I know you're engaging with council um, in recent months on that too. Yes, uh, again, hugely important. We have been engaging with the local council and also been engaging um, with a number of local stakeholders, just about a range of issues. And uh, of course, this issue comes up. And so, as part of the city deal, it's being progressed within that framework. Um, I understand that there's an interim business case there and hopefully there'll be some decisions coming forward, but very keen to see this progress. And I know that some of the concerns that have been expressed, you know, would be that the Newry Southern Relief Road is in some way similar to the Narrow Water Bridge. I just want to reassure you that in my mind, these are two very distinct uh, projects. One does not take away from the other. In fact, I think that the provision of both is hugely complementary to the entire area. Yeah, I suppose. So just to minister from my own mind then, in terms of the design of the, the Southern Relief Road, is there any um, progress in relation to that and, and how that will look? As the department, I know from speaking to officials in the past, they had said that, you know, the option they're looking at at the minute was a fixed bridge, but that was only in terms of um, the work they were at at this, that stage. But ha has there been any progress in looking at options of a lift, lifting bridge from the department? 
Yeah, so um, we have been taking soundings across the board with local stakeholders. It's very clear to me that the preference is for Lifton Bridge. We have asked the local council to do some work because obviously there will be ongoing maintenance costs and so forth to Lifton Bridge. So we're awaiting that further information and that piece of analysis coming to us from the local council. Thank you. That's me. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and I'd like to thank the Minister and Jeremy for coming along here this morning. And I first want to echo the words that you're from yourself in terms of thanks to um, all uh, staff within the remit of the department um, and th those key workers for, for the services given so far, and particularly um, uh, to condemn and to offer my thoughts to the bus driver and the passengers on board the bus, which was hijacked uh, a while ago uh, and set fire to. That was a disgraceful incident, and I hope the bus driver is recovering after what has been a, a very traumatic uh, incident. Um, just a couple of things. Um, what, what I'm starting to notice is we're starting to emerge out of lockdown and there's relaxations. Um, so we know the stay-at-home order um, has gone and that there's further relaxations on the horizon over the weeks ahead. There's real fears that we're going to see a car-led recovery. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, other parts of the United Kingdom have been, been taking forward initiatives to try to avoid that. So in England, they published the Bus Back Better um, policy document in terms of trying to encourage more people to use bus travel. Uh, I know other parts, uh, particularly in the Republic of Ireland, have put in significant more investment in terms of uh, active travel. Um, I do welcome the initiatives which were taken at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of the pop-up cycle lanes, um, and they, they are to be welcomed. But really, in, in terms of avoiding that car-led recovery, we need to see in sort of initiatives which are um, quickly taken and our uh, proper interventions to ensure that we don't have that car-led recovery. And I just want to see uh, from the Minister, is there any particular initiative she's planning on taking over the next number of weeks and months to ensure that we don't have that car-led recovery? Because we need a green recovery, not that. Uh, thank you. And thank you for your comments about um, solidarity with the bus driver whose bus was attacked and then obviously the train driver and crew who were subjected yeah. to that horrific incident where someone deliberately put a car on a track and set it on light, knowing that a train was on its way. And it's only for the swift action of our train driver. Um, she undoubtedly saved lives, you know. Um, and so thank you for that. I know that's shared by, by the entire committee. Um, I think you're absolutely right. You know, we have seen an increase in the volume of traffic on our roads. I think we can actually correlate it to the return of schools. I think the restart of schools, we've all noticed a visible difference in terms of the number of cars on a road. Um, I've been very clear that we need to have a green recovery from COVID. We've rallied around each other to tackle the COVID crisis, and we need to do exactly the same for the climate crisis. Um, and so that's why we've been putting money, whether it's through the revitalisation fund with councils or separate through the Brew Green Fund to enhance pedestrianisation um, spaces to provide the pop up um, cycle lanes. We're also doing a lot of work around parklets, and we have issued um, guidance to all of the councils, and we're working with them to be identifying space. And it's, for me, it's all about reimagining our spaces to make it more people centred. So there's a range of things that we are doing there. Um, I suppose the, the challenge is, you know, I said from the beginning that I wasn't going to impose change from on high. Um, I certainly don't know what will work on the streets of Newry or the, the, the streets in Bangor. So we have had the very much work with local councils to help us to identify potential pop-up cycle lanes and, and where we can take parking away, for example, and transform that space. So we have been very keen to work with councils to identify spaces for us and to continue that rollout. I think the other issue here is just the challenges around public transport as well. Um, for many people will not be able to walk or cycle to their destination. And so we're also working very hard with TransLink and with, again, across the islands in terms of shared learning to make sure that we can rebuild passenger confidence to get people back onto uh, our buses and trains in greater number and to leave the cars behind. That's why I think it's really important that we make efforts, even in a difficult financial climate, to make our public transport network as accessible and as attractive as possible. And so you'll know, for example, that we have purchased 21 new train carriages. We have the um, hydrogen fuel buses 
uh, in operation from December. We've also purchased uh, more uh, low uh, emission and zero emission uh, bus fleet as well, which we'll be utilising in both Derry and Belfast. So I suppose it's trying to come at that from all angles. But I also have to be honest. You know, I have been frustrated um, at the pace uh, of change. Um, it hasn't went as quickly as perhaps I would like, uh, and I know that that frustration is shared, you know, across across the board. But I suppose it's just continuing to drive on and to push ahead. And so that's why in the next few weeks I hope to be in a position to publish, for example, the Belfast um, Bicycle Network Plan. And again, that's about showing ambition, but also very clearly saying that strategies are all well and good, but unless they're backed up with resource, then you know, we're not going to be able to make these things happen. So just to reassure you, we're continuing um, to work to, do, to maximise the opportunities that we can provide to people so that they can engage in sustainable and active travel. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. And I, I do share your frustration, but also you have my support in terms of driving that change, and it's important that we do do, do that. Um, in relation to the train driver, um, uh, that, that incident was absolutely despicable. But one thing I did notice is on Twitter, someone replied and said that, uh, and, and made an assumption that the train driver was a male. And I think the fact that the train driver was a female is a great sign of progress in our society. But the fact that some people still make those assumptions, I think it's an important issue that we challenge that bias in our society and that we encourage more participation from uh, different genders within our public transport system. Uh, in terms of turning around and del delivering that green recovery rather than the car-led recovery, you do have uh, an increased capital budget, uh, but obviously the resource budget is, uh, isn't great, to put it mildly. What, what ways are you considering to more innovatively deliver that capital budget to ensure that projects can proceed? Because what we're hearing is because the resource budget is constrained, that's inhibiting the ability to have staff resources to deliver capital. And one of the best examples of a, a green recovery would be delivering that phase two of glider. Uh, that would be a great example of a bus back better strategy, but we do need to be able to deliver that capital funding and what innovative ways we're considering to be able to take forward those projects. Okay, thank you for that. As you said, the phase two of the glider is part of the Belfast city region. Daily, I think it's hugely important that that proceeds. I think, you know, if you look at the vibrant cities around the world, they're very much pedestrianised spaces. Um, they're places that are very accessible by using public transport. Um, they're not places that are very accessible or affordable, for example, if you're looking to just park up your car all day. So it's kind of these are the challenges that we're going to have to overcome. And I think there's huge opportunities. I'm a signatory to the Boulder Belfast vision, and I think it's very important that we progress that alongside you know, making sure that there's the complementary York Street interchange project to that, making sure that it's complementary in terms of kind of the University of Ulster, for example, its presence there. So I actually think this time around, there's an awful lot of synergies um, that are happening right across Northern Ireland. And I certainly am, am of the view that there is a firm appetite among our citizens for us to be embracing this different way and this green recovery. So I'm very keen that I'm able to support that through capital uh, investment. As you say, the resource is extremely challenging. Um, the £20 million Blue Green Fund, which I had set up, which was to act as this catalyst uh, for cultural change and infrastructural change, you know, has started to kickstart things. Uh, we've been very keen to say to councils, keep progressing your Greenway proposals, for example, because we want to come in to provide you with that capital support. So I think a lot of the energies in, in this year, since the restoration of the institutions, has been working with partners to make sure that we can get proposals to the point where they're ready for construction. And that has been, you know, it has taken in a bit of time, um, but I'm very clearly committed. I've said the tackle on the climate emergency is one of my priorities, and so I want to do what I can, whether it's through the purchase of lower zero emission fleet, whether it's through the advancement of our rail network, whether it's looking at you know, hydrogen fuel and working with other ministers to see how we can be a world leader in terms of hydrogen here in Northern Ireland. I'm very committed to doing what we can across the board in that, and I actually think it's a hugely exciting time for us here. Yeah, I think we can build a better future from what we had in the past. Um, one thing around that is about EV charging. Uh, I'm going to be frank here. The EV charging network in Northern Ireland is atrocious. Okay? There's market failure in relation to that. You go to a lot of these chargers, they're broken. Um, I, you know, I don't have an EV car. And partially one of the reasons is because if you actually dr driven to some of these places, you would actually not have the confidence that you were able to get it charged up. Uh, and what is being done potentially to, to address this market failure? We need to have 
a much better charging network. And I know ESB have the contract for that, but like that contract isn't working and we do need to find a way to ensure that we'll have a better charging network. And there's been, you know, a number of activists have been in contact with me really wanting to see if that can be improved and to see if the department can intervene and see if we can sort this out. And I do get frustrated that there's a bit of ping pong going back between the department and the council. We just need better chargers and we need a better network and people are very frustrated. Yeah, no, and you raise a, a good point. I do have an e-car, my ministerial car. So I live, well, sorry, Billy lives the, the excruciating challenges of trying to find um, charging infrastructure. Um, We've seen the UK um, ambition around banning the sale of diesel vehicles. There's a clear direction of travel here towards electric vehicles and our infrastructure here in Northern Ireland falls behind. We had seen the utility regulator remove the maximum um, retail price and we had hoped that that would have seen you know, more commercial providers entering the market. That hasn't happened. So what I've asked my officials to do is to be working with the current provider, ESB, to retrofit the existing charging infrastructure um, because it is, it's old and it's not working. Um, so we're doing that piece of work. I've also changed the permitted development rights. So the planning system is much more supportive in terms of e-charging infrastructure. The Office of Low Emission Vehicles um, has you know, significant funding opportunities. Now, they're not available. I'm advised to ESB, for example, but they are available to local councils. And so we've been working with councils to see can we draw down or can they draw down funding? We had, there's been workshops and so forth. Um, and then obviously my department has contributed to the EU Interreg Faster project as well, which will see the provision of new infrastructure. But certainly I agree with you that there needs to be, if we want to be ambitious around this and we want to enable citizens to make that switch, then we are going to have to significantly improve the charging infrastructure network. That also means the provision of charging at home as well. That's a key part of it. So it's working with the Office of uh, Low Emission Vehicles to maximise the potential for funding opportunities. I've also recently met with Minister Poots on this issue as well. I'm hoping to meet with Minister Dodds as well, because I think this is an area where our departments should collaborate. And I've also said to my officials through the Blue Green Fund, is, is there potential there for my department to play a more proactive role in terms of you know, supporting the improvement of the infrastructure? So I agree with you, this is an area that needs significant improvement. And I want to ensure that my department you know, is as proactive as it can be in terms of supporting that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be very brief for the last bit because the chair will probably uh, knock me off her Christmas card list if we continue much longer. Uh, <laughs> it's just in relation to the 2011 uh, Planning, um, 2011 Planning Act, the review, the consultation closed for that just recently. Can I get an assurance that all the consultation responses will be properly considered and the department will do everything it can to consider those responses and ensure that we focus on quick changes that can be done, particularly around processing times, because they are they're not great and they need to be improved. Yep. Uh, so in terms of the, the review of the Planning Act, uh, as you say, and there was a number of representations from committee members on you know, the need to extend the consultation period, which we did, and as you say, that it closed on Friday. Um, from memory, I think we've had 53 maybe consultation responses, but I can assure you that all of those will be very fairly and carefully um, considered. Um, there is an issue, I've said in, in my opening remarks, about the role of the planning system in terms of our economic recovery and our green recovery from COVID. And so there's the planning forum, which is a cross-departmental piece of work to look at the specific issue of consultee responses and what we can do to improve that. I think that's hugely important. As you say, the review of the Act will also play an important element here in terms of making improvements in the planning system. Um, the portal as well should help to streamline uh, some aspects of it, which I think is important, and stakeholders were telling us they wanted to see that happening. And then the other element for me is very much around community engagement and so that's why the department has set up the kind of community engagement partnership uh, led by community places as well and so there's work ongoing there to ensure that we have a planning system where community feels that it can get involved and also community feels that it can have an impact and have a say so that work um, continues uh, and I think it's hugely important that we do have you know a modern planning system that supports economic recovery that supports the green recovery as well but also has communities involved and not alienated from it Thank you very much, and apologies, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Uh, where have we been? How hasn't been done? Oh, sorry, do yourself, Germany, again, on, on the uh, issue of TVA. Just a quick one. If you 
I agree with all you're doing and what you're putting in place and whatnot coming up. But if it was all given a fair win, when would you see some form of normality returning? Six months? Eight months? Well, as I said to Keith earlier, uh, David, uh, it, it's going to be very difficult to put a time frame on it. I mean, our, our ambition is to bring forward as many of our staffing resource and the additional buildings to maximise the number of tests that we can deliver. We probably lost somewhere in the region of 10 months of testing. Um, uh, and that, that theory test figure um, in terms of those who can take their driving test will clearly uh, increase now that the theory test service runs back. But I would like to think that we would make a significant dent um, within those figures within the next six, six months, particularly um, over the summer period, um, you know, where the lighter nights afford us to conduct more more driving tests, um, um, where we can do those into the early evening. Put a bit of on it there to see. So, you know, uh, certainly, uh, I mean, our ambition is to do it as quickly as we possibly can, and the demand, and, and, and obviously, what how we do will be, you know, reported through our monthly statistics, and we can keep a close eye on that and keep it continuously under review. But our commitment is to maximise the resource that's available to deliver the tests. Uh, on the capital side of things, York Street interchange again, Minister, and yeah. you've indicated that you've asked for further updates to be brought back in, in the autumn time. Obviously, we were very close to appointing a contractor at one stage, and work could have been well underway. Again, time scales on this one, and you know, affects my constituents who are trying to get onto the M1 here, travelling Dungannon, Portadown, Lurgan. What they spend more time sitting at the West Link than what they do on actual M1 itself. <laughs> so, is there any uh, things are being pushed back quite significantly now? So, any time scales on that one? Yep. Um, so, on the York Street interchange. Um, it will subject a legal challenge, which, which set it back, you'll know, David. Um, I think the issue here is that this scheme is from 2008, and it's a hugely important project in terms of being strategically important. Um, but I also think there's a responsibility to ensure that when we're moving these big capital projects forward, that we're making sure that it's fit for purpose and modern. And so that's why I wanted to take that kind of breather, if you like, to look at it again, to make sure that you know it was fit for purpose um, in terms of the emerging policies of the executive, but also, say, Belfast City Council in particular. Um, so, as you know, the, there were six recommendations made. I've accepted all six of them. Um, and there's that additional work that's going to take place now around placemaking. So, I've said, because I am keen that this moves forward, so we've set the, the time frame of this autumn for that report to come to me, and then it will be about deciding on the next step. So, I can't give definitive time. I think I have come to learn as the Infrastructure Minister on capital projects, it is always challenging to give a definitive time frame because you know, of, the, of the challenges, not least, that, that come forward. But I do want to reassure you that I think this is hugely important. and It is not about not doing this project. It is about making sure that we do it, and we do it in the right way, that impacts those that use it, and importantly, the people who live around it as well. I think that is really important. It has been very much severed um, by the existing you know, infrastructure there, and so I am just very keen that we push ahead and get this, get this right. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the Infrastructure Commission yeah. at the end. There seems to be ways to spread support for that. Uh, you brought it forward. Uh, when, when can we see that? Maybe come to the Executive. Have you submitted papers there? Or? Yeah. I am not allowed to divulge executive business, um, but I am engaging with executive colleagues on it. And, um, I think I have met with almost all of the ministers now, um, and we have met with a range of stakeholders. So, um, what I have been saying to executive colleagues is you know, I have put some information forward and hoping that they will give that consideration and that we can try to identify a way forward. I absolutely believe that this is the right move. I think the right move is to look at infrastructure in its widest sense. So you're looking at digital infrastructure as well as the road and, and rail network as well. And so I'd be very hopeful that we can find um, consensus and agreement on the way forward. I know some executive colleagues have raised issues about kind of the delivery end of it as well as the commission. Um, and so I've been engaging with the, the chair of the Infrastructure Commission in England as well to gain some learning on that. So I would really hope that we'd be in a position where we can find agreement to try to take this forward, whether that would be perhaps a cross-departmental working group that would examine the practicalities of the outworkings of the Commission. Um, but certainly I think if we're going to be serious about transforming our economy, then you know we need to look around our neighbours and see that they're taking a competitive advantage on us by having an, an independent infrastructure commission in place and, and so I'm hoping to, you know, as an executive we'll be able to take this forward. 
Okay, thank you. I know there's a few members to come yet, and I think everyone's been touched upon there. But I would emphasise the one big thing I was going to bring forward today was the road safety. Right. I know it's important to Ro- you. Road safety. I know Ms. Kimmins has, has, has spoken about that. Yeah. But uh, if, if we're looking at the the fatalities early on in this year, what's expected for the rest of the year it is really worrying uh, as to those trends. So, thank you. No, and I know that that's an issue that's close to your heart. You've raised it with me a number of times, and I mean, even as recently as yesterday, I met with Mr. and Mrs. Gallagher, who lost their son Martin. Uh, he was killed by a dangerous driver as well. And I think when you're sitting down with family members who are bereaved, it really brings it home to you about the importance of this issue and how they live with the trauma of that every day. So I think it's about all of us doing everything that we can to improve road safety and then also making sure around consequences as well for, you know, in the instance that has been discussed with me recently, sometimes we have repeat offenders in this area as well. So I think across the board, we need to, we need to really try to tackle this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair. I must put my request in the night before because most of the questions have been asked already, but I'll try and get some in. Um, Minister, I've been trying to suggest online theory testing um, to the department. Have, have you considered that? I, I know they use it in the South partially for the likes of driving instructors and bus and truck learners. Um, have you any discussions with any officials in the South in relation to trying to run online theory tests? Yeah. yeah, so this is an area that we've actually been keeping um, a close eye on. We're trying to move on to kind of digital platforms for a range of services within DBA. The challenge here is one around security and around technology. And I also think there's a consideration that I have to give to digital connectivity or lack of, particularly in our rural areas as well. So the assessment from my officials is we're not at the stage yet where you could move that completely online, but we do continue to work in this area and once we get to the point where we're convinced that the technology is secure enough then that's when we will we'll make the move online as well i don't know jeremy if you want to add anything to that no um, simply just to re- reiterate those points around security and connectivity um, we're not at the stage where technology is, allows us to uh, bring on bring forward the online testing however we, we are a, a joint authority contract at the minute and we're moving to a, a, a new theory test contract with the dbsa Um, which uh, we will keep under review and as soon as the technology does allow us to move to that online uh, service that's something certainly we'll be looking very closely to. Just in terms of the backlog, uh, Jeremy, there's 22,000 customers who hold a private car theory test certificate but they haven't worked a practical driving test. I mean, how how can you give assurance or what's the time frames in relation to trying to address that backlog? Yeah, um, Cathal, it's, it's a, obviously a question that has come up um, in terms of trying to put a figure on a timescale around delivery. Um, yeah, that 22,000 figure is, is the category B um, that we have identified in terms of ha- hold the valid uh, test pass certificate now. And as, as the chair had said, that will increase once theory testing. So, I mean, our ambition has to be to deliver as many um, uh, driving tests as we can um, from Saturday when, or from Friday when the, when the service resumes. And uh, you know, with the additional resources that we put in place, uh, our plans to move to four new additional centres on top of the 16 that we have, um, all of those um, proposals to take forward is to increase our capacity um, as soon as we possibly can and start to work through that backlog. But uh, I am reluctant to put a time scale on it. Um, I do think, as I said to David, we will make significant inroads over the next uh, six months, but we'll have to keep it closely under review. Okay, thanks. And I'm just moving through as quickly as I can, Chair. Um, in, in terms of the, the MOT tests and the certificates, last week we had an issue about communication where the people you know, needed were going to be told that they needed a test. Have, have we cleared those communication lines with the people out there? Yeah. For those that need a test, our, our advice is always that we will continue to issue reminder letters when uh, the vehicles need to be brought forward uh, for test. Um, obviously, um, some temporary exemption certificates have been extended to, uh, you know, as a result of the COVID controls that remain in place at our test centres. Um, our, our advice to cons- customers is that they do nothing until the reminder letter issues approximately six weeks before their test is due. And when that reminder letter issues, then that is the time as early as they can to book a test so that they can secure an appointment at a test centre of their choosing. Thank you. And just two, two final questions. And these are for the Minister. And I'll take the opportunity to put some local stuff on, on the map if we can, Minister. Minister, I understand you're helping to fund the feasibility study in relation to the 
extension of rail from Porta down to Armagh. And, you know, we know there's a very strong lobby group here. And I'm just wondering, um, in relation to the, the Strategic Transport Network Plan, is there any suggestions of putting that on, on that map? Or can you give us a wee update on where you're at for that? Yep, thank you. Yeah, as you say, um, I am part funding the feasibility study for Portadown Armagh. They'd already carried out uh, a piece of analysis up to this point. Um, so I felt it was important in terms of trying to move that on to step in in that instance. In terms of um, additional new feasibility studies, as you say, the um, Strategic Regional Strategic Transport Network, <laughs> I could just never get that right, I want to change the name of it, um, is going out for consultation later this year, Cahill. So um, again, that's to reshape our road and rail network, um, you know, over the next number of decades. So I would really encourage members who feel very passionately, particularly around rail in their locality, to be feeding it through that consultation process because that will shape things over the next couple of decades. No, Mister, it's just in relation to what Andrew had said about Charlie. You know that rural people are reliant on cars. I mean, here's an opportunity for for serious with green technology and moving people forward this is an opportunity for us um, and, and I think we need to take that opportunity J just in relation to another local issue obviously the interconnector which are, you're, you're familiar with now I mean the Taoiseach has now committed a review of the interconnector you know and serious examination on the ground option have you had any discussions with the with the minister or with the Taoiseach or with the department in relation to this you know that there's over six and a half thousand objections in this area and people feel very strongly about it I'm just wondering, can you give us a wee update on your views now? Yep. Um, so I'm aware of the, the Taoiseach's um, recent commitment to a review of the project. I suppose it's about the role of my department, and my department has no role in the development of the project. The responsibility in relation to the proposal is limited to the assessment of the plan and application, and it's the plan and application as submitted by the applicant for the part of the project in the north. So I think the issue here is that my department has a very clear and separate role as to perhaps the Taoiseach would have um, on these instances, given that my role and the department's role was to assess and, and make a decision on the plan and application. Okay, and, and finally, I just want to put this in. Any, any, um, any suggestions or any more options for more funding for the taxi operator or taxi drivers, Minister? Yeah, thank you. So, as I said, I'm conscious that there's a number of sectors who will be who will continue to be impacted by COVID, and while it's very welcome that we're moving to kind of the safe reopening, um, there still will be challenges presented. I suppose the issue here is what support is the executive going to provide to those sectors in the new financial year. Um, and obviously, I'm committed to working with the sectors, and I'll work with executive colleagues to ensure that we can provide support to a range of sectors who continue to be impacted by COVID and the outworkings of that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Hello there uh, again. Thank you, Minister, for giving uh, so much of your time. Um, on occasion, the Minister have told us about a one-hour slot, so uh, I welcome your availability. Um, my first question is, is actually to Jeremy. Just to go back to the driving tests. Um, there's huge backlog there, and you've spoken of additional examiners and additional centres. Can you give clarity on how this uh, increases your ability in terms of your base level of, of testing? Uh, without starting on overtime, how does that compare to pre-COVID times? Well, Roy, currently we have 37 full-time driving examiners, and in addition to that, we have dual role examiners that uh, predominantly do, you know, vehicle examination and driving tests. Um, our ambition then is to ensure that over the next uh, months, in particular, that those dual role examiners fundamentally um, do driving tests as the majority of their of their role. In addition to that, we are bringing forward, you know, 30 um, temporary and permanent examiners. Uh, in some cases, to backfill those positions in the vehicle examining um, in their vehicle examining role to free up that resource. 
And to date, we've recruited an additional 25 examiners, and 17 of those are already in post, with the remainder to be in post by mid-May. So um, ultimately, that resource that has always been used to um, deal with peak demands, we will keep that resource now because we obviously are on peak demand with regard to the driving test because of the COVID restrictions. And uh, to manage the ongoing COVID controls that we've had to put in place, the additional um, four centres that I mentioned earlier on will um, help to manage the, the staffing um, and the, the risk assessments at those sites uh, and provide additional capacity. So, I mean, that essentially is trying to get our dual role examiners um, to do the frontline driving tests and, and, and keep them doing that for the next um, you know, four to six months is our ambition. I'm looking for clarity. Uh, what would have been your uh, typical monthly test capability pre-COVID, and what is your baseline capability now? Our pre-COVID um, number of tests that we're doing, going back to the last sort of full year that we had, where driving tests were being conducted, was uh, just under 4,000 uh, driving tests, 3,900 Category B tests. So with this additional resource. Um, and I say a lot of uh, the resource that we'll be bringing forward will be the dual role, and there will be um, voluntary uh, offerings for staff to do evening tests, etc. I say I am reluctant to put a figure on it, um, but I, I, I certainly believe that we can increase our capacity significantly um, over over the next number of months, and we'll certainly be happy to, to share those figures with the committee uh, and come back to the committee and explain uh, how that is progressing in, in the months ahead. Will it be more than 4,000, more than 5,000? We do need clarity because well, certainly, um, I, I'm concerned in the past we've been told there's, there's been a reduction because of COVID restrictions and procedures, etc. So will we have increased capacity? Otherwise, the list will get longer. Yeah, we, will, or, um, we are working towards an increased capacity that will exceed 4,000. By how much? I mean, I, I'd indicated to Keith I would like to think we could do an additional 1,000 tests per month, and that could be a conservative figure. And once we get back to that full testing from, from, from Friday, uh, I would be confident that we would be able to exceed that uh, 3,900 figure. Oh, okay, uh, th thanks. thanks for that. Uh, and again, I welcome the fact that you've been prioritising um, tests for, for uh, health service, etc. Uh, but I have been made aware of that, for instance, that um, there's particular problems with HGV, HGV drivers, category C, uh, C plus uh, and E driver testing, etc. Um, uh, so is, is a degree of priority been given there? Because I've been advised that some companies are having to park up vehicles to having insufficient numbers of of drivers coming into the sector, uh, and again, I've also been made aware um, of uh, key workers, um, and one in particular um, providing support for rural broadband, which is enabling people to work from home, etc. Uh, who who have had extensive delays in, in uh, availability being given for a test. Test been cancelled three times. You know due to COVID, not due to, to yourself or, or your organisation, but due to the health situation. But I'm just curious, has any consideration been given to giving some priorities to such key workers? At the uh, start, um, when we resumed driving tests back in September, we did um, look at uh, prioritising um, driving tests for a range of uh, key workers and critical workers. And the problem with that is that there is a lot of people out there that have um, justification to say that they need their vehicles, and for us to manage that process was proving very difficult. So we had identified that those key workers whose jobs were ancillary to medical health and social care services who are required to drive for their purposes of work, we would prioritise those and we would engage with their relevant employers, which we have done so, uh, and ask them to come forward and identify that staff um, that, that do need those priority tests. We have worked um, very closely with the Northern Ambulance Service in that regard and the Northern Trust to facilitate those tests, albeit a small number. Uh, but they open that wider for other critical uh, workers uh, is not in the plan um, at present. Um, moreover, our focus is to increase the capacity of tests that we can do so that everybody can avail of a test at the earliest uh, appointment. So that is, that is the current position with how we will pri prioritise um, the, the sort of category B group. Um, you mentioned the heavy goods vehicles, lorry, lorry drivers. 
that is managed very locally. Um, we only deliver tests at certain centres for the heavy goods vehicles, so we will be working with our um, key stakeholders and the training academies, academies to accommodate as many of those tests. All categories have resumed, and it is trying to find a balance, and we have certain um, examiners that are skilled to do heavy vehicle uh, testing. Not all can do it, so the test centre managers have to manage that resource and trying to find a balance between doing the Category B and the other categories of tests that they are also responsible for. So that is a piece of work that uh, you know is ongoing at that local management level, at that centre management level. Uh, then turning to MOTs, um, um, in the past people were being notified by, by correspondence that they needed uh, an MOT test, um, but then when they went online to try and get a booking, there weren't slots available within that notification period. So is, has that been resolved so that people are given clarity if they're needing a test and given the sufficient time so that there will be slots available? Uh, well, as I said earlier on, the reminder letters are now issued six weeks in advance, and there um, is, is sufficient capacity across the network to facilitate a test. Now, we would advise customers to act um, soon when they get the reminder letters, letters to book a test, so hopefully they can avail of an appointment at the centre of their choosing. Um, there, there was challenges um, before the Minister introduced the additional four-month TEC extension for those vehicles from uh, four to nine years old, where some people with TECs were booking tests when they didn't require them, and we went through an exercise to uh, cancel those appointments out and uh, you know, uh, contact those customers and, and, and refund their fees, um, and, and those four-month TECs have now been, been applied. So that has taken a bit of pressure off the, the test centre network, and uh, you know, the MOT testing stats for March were um, significantly improved in January and, and February, and that's due to the dedication of the staff that have been testing um, you know, on Sundays and indeed the bank holidays to try and address the, the demand for tests. So the position that we reported last time should have significantly eased by now, Roy. Okay. And turning to the Minister, in, in terms of the budget going forward, um, uh, the figure of £45 million for road million, maintenance, I, I've spotted, and that's considerably below that which is required for a, a standstill situation, so our roads will be deteriorating. So my question for you, Minister, is how do you determine the balance between your new build schemes and maintaining what we have at present? Because if we don't do that, all these new roads uh, will actually contribute to a deteriorating road surface throughout Northern Ireland? Yep. Um, yeah, so I, I bid for £120 million pounds for um, capital maintenance to address the very issues that you have raised. And there is no secret of the fact that when you have systemic and you know, uh, underinvestment over many years in your road network, it deteriorates. And so you'll be aware of the Barton report which says, and it was an objective analysis, that you know, there's a requirement on £140 million pounds per annum just to keep the, the network in a satisfactory state. So we're starting from a very difficult um, position. Um, what I have to do is, you know, in terms of the budget decisions that I make, um, the capital requirement for this year, given the number of projects that are live, actually exceeds the allocation that I've been given. Um, I think the flagships alone are around £550 million, pounds, so that has to be taken out of my budget. Then you have to look at inescapables, that gets taken out of your budget. So actually what you're left with uh, in terms of the discretionary choices that you have as Minister is extremely limited. In saying that, I've said from the start that I want to be transformative, but I also realise as a Minister that if you're not dealing with the issues that affect people's daily lives, be that street lighting, uh, potholes, then you can't expect a citizen to have faith or confidence in you as a minister or as an executive. That is always a very difficult balancing point. But as I said, I think it was in response to Mr Buchanan. I have set aside the Rural Roads Fund. There was a £10 million allocation to that. I would be very keen to increase that um, where we can so that we're trying to get that balance right but of course it's hugely difficult we have spoken at length here about the green recovery the green recovery really necessitates a new way of working it necessitates a new way of prioritizing investment um, and we can't fund everything so of course i'm not going to pretend mr beggs that there aren't difficult decisions ahead what i want to do is to continue with the parameters of trying to get the basics right um, but also trying to be ambitious and transformative for our citizens as well 
Uh, no, on that, Roy, just second. to say, uh, sorry, you know, there, there's significant funding opportunities, I hope, coming forward from the British Government as well, uh, in terms of infrastructure and as well as the Shared Island Unit. So I always try to look for the positives. While they have been given a difficult budget this time round, you know, there are funding opportunities uh, that weren't with it weren't there before, and so I'm keen to work north, south, east, and west to try to maximise the funding partners that we have, so that we can do more for people living right across Northern Ireland. But, but, but are, are you and the executive not being short-sighted in continuing with NDNA commitments which were not funded, and taking the money off the basic maintenance to, to pay for it? No, um, Mr. Beggs, because I entered into the executive, like um, the Minister for Health and like all ministers, in good faith. It was based on new decade and your approach. That's a commitment that we have made to the people of Northern Ireland as parties in the executive, but also as two governments. And so what I'm focused on doing is rather than have less ambition for our citizens and say, well, you were made these promises, but we're not going to live up to them, damaging the credibility of all of us and our integrity, is to continue to make the representations to both the British and Irish governments to secure the funding that's required so that we can deliver on the promises that we've made people. Well, I, I wish you well in your endeavours to get to get more funding. Um, in terms of Yorkgate, um, you started a, a review last uh, July, and we've had an interim report. Um, is there a concept plan? Is there some clear idea of what has come out of it? Because uh, another two point seven million pounds being committed to do further planning and consultation and research, and uh, uh, I certainly don't have a clear picture. Having got planning permission, what we're actually looking at now and, and, and why um, uh, the project has completely stalled, even though planning permission is in place and I understand funding in place? It, there isn't funding in place. It's an NDNA commitment, but as you alluded to in your previous question, the funding is yet to come across for our NDNA commitments. Although I was very clear that in terms of my budget decisions last year, that I was, was making sure that we could continue to develop those strategically important infrastructure schemes that were executive flagships, but also commitments within New Decade, New Approach. Uh, the York Street interchange is installed. What I've done is I've been clear that we need to make sure that we get it right. I don't want to be in front of a PAC committee or my successor to be in front of a PAC committee explaining why vast sums of public money were spent on a project that was you know, conceived um, 14, 13, 14 years ago that isn't meeting the needs of our economy, that isn't meeting the needs in terms of, of our climate and our environment, and isn't meeting the needs of the community who lives around it. So that's why I commissioned the short, sharp external review. It reported back. I've accepted the six recommendations, put those clearly into the public domain, and now there's a, an, a, an additional piece of work to make sure that we're making it modern, making sure that we're getting it future-proofed, and that's why I've set very clear parameters to say I want to have that piece of work completed by the autumn so that we can advance this project, but we can advance it in the right way. And then finally, uh, in, in terms of the A5, the interim report has been stark, actually, in, in terms of criticism. Uh, and including one section which says that phase three is unjustifiable and should be removed and a clear recommendation that the issue of phasing needs uh, reviewed. I mean, I raised this with you yesterday, but I, I wish to further highlight my concerns that to continue to ignore uh, the, the planning recommendations, even in an interim report, um, may well lead to further and further delay and successful legal challenge and perhaps nothing on the ground in 10 years' time. So, so what, what I am asking you, Minister, is will you take these uh, recommendations seriously so that vital improvements can occur without continuing delay? And I thank you for your contribution in the adjournment debate yesterday evening. I have accepted the recommendations of the interim PIC report. There were 30 recommendations, and I came in for criticism uh, in some quarters for uh, giving very careful consideration to the recommendations and accepting them. And by accepting them, we're very clearly saying that we are going to give them very careful consideration. The key recommendations around flood risk, um, and environmental um, information. We have agreed that we will complete that, that there will be uh, an environmental statement as an addendum, that we will go out to public consultation. And as the um, uh, inspector requested, we will provide that additional information so that the public inquiry can be reconvened um, early next year. So it's certainly not a case of ignoring the uh, interim PAC report at all. Just to reassure you on that. Thank you. We will see. Thank you.
Thank you, Mrs. Kelly. <laughs> thanks very much, and uh, thanks, Minister. Um, I just want to ask, uh, in relation to the uh, Greenway and Blue Way um, funding scheme for next year, and the uh, ask, if you like, of local councils to be shovel ready. You yeah. know, so a lot of them are working at risk. So I just wonder what the time scale might be in terms of the decision making process. Thank you. So I'm a huge supporter of Greenways because of the multiple benefits that they bring for health and wellbeing, for the environment and all of that. And so this was a key driver in terms of setting up the Blue Green Fund. Um, and while we've been able to support a number of Greenways in the financial year just passed, we have been writing out to councils to reassure them that while we're operating from single year budgets, which is you know hugely dissatisfactory, we have been saying that there will be capital monies there, and so we're asking you to get your projects ready to the point of construction so that my department can then come in and help to fund them. Um, so I know that work is continuing a pace in a number of councils, and so I would be very keen that where there are projects that are ready for capital investment that we're able to support them in this new financial year as well. Okay, thank you. And um, there's a couple of uh, bits I wanted to ask. There a lot of recent uh, publicity around the failure of the First Minister to designate a unionist representative to attend the SNMC. And I know there's another meeting about transport coming up shortly. Have you received a commitment that that meeting will go ahead and there will be representation on a cross-party basis? Yeah, so the, the north-south sectoral meetings are just they're very important. I mean, they're not controversial. Uh, part of it is looking at you know connectivity, but it's also about progressing the NDNA commitments as well. Unfortunately, the meeting on Friday didn't go ahead, um, but we are looking at alternative dates to suit um, all, all of the ministers' diaries. And so I would be very hopeful that I'll get confirmation of when we will be rescheduling uh, the NSMC sectoral meeting on transport. Just because I think it's very important that we work collaboratively across the islands. Uh, one Two members have already mentioned the Narrow Water Bridge, and you'll know it's a project that's close to the heart of the late PJ Bradley, who campaigned alongside colleagues down there for that. I take it that's part of the Shared Island and the NDNA project. So yeah. I just wondered, um, uh, in terms of it uh, specifically, you know, is it something that's held back by not having an NSMC meetings in terms of it? Yeah, I mean, Narrow Water Bridge has been around for a very long time. As you say, you know, Eddie McGrady and others um, have campaigned for decades um, for it. And I genuinely think it is a transformative project to believe that to be the case. Um, I think there are huge opportunities in the Shared Island Fund. Um, the Taoiseach has made it clear that that is about infrastructure projects um, north and south. So I'd be very keen to see the Narrow Water Bridge project advanced and for it to be supported by the Shared Island unit as well. I also think there's massive opportunities for active travel as well as a complement to the bridge um, and having like a, a greenway uh, linkage and hold, uh, transform the area in terms of active travel. I think that would be great for the local communities, but also good for tourism. I think through COVID, what we're going to realise is that um, our Indigenous industries are hugely important. People are going to travel at home and also, you know, we have beautiful spots across Northern Ireland that people should be coming over to, to visit. So whatever we can do to enhance our tourism offering, I think, you know, it's essential. And so I'm very keen to work with all partners to get Narrow Water Bridge moving. So people have been waiting on it for a very long time. But, but just on that point, in terms of staycations, it's the new N-word, um, is there much... Uh, correspondence and dialogue between your officials and the economy and tourism sectors within that department to look at how best uh, to support uh, that as an industry or, or enterprise going forward? Yeah, the Minister for Economy has set up a tourism recovery working group and my officials have been feeding into that. I think that was one of the key impetuses for us providing support when we were given the powers to the bus and coach operators, for example, because they're the backbone of the tourism industry, whether it's the cruise ships if once they can come back. But you know, they're a key element of um, our tourism industry. So it was really important I felt that we supported them. Um, but we'll also do work with Waterways Ireland as well. Um, what we saw during the pandemic was a huge increase in the number of people engaging with their blue infrastructure um, as part of the staycation. Uh, and so I think it's very important that we do what we can to enhance our natural assets, um, not only in terms of the benefits they bring for health and recreation and the environment, but also in terms of our tourism offering. We have wonderful natural assets here in Northern Ireland, and I think there's responsibility in all of us to be selling that. 
Well, Chair, last week we received a presentation from Waterways Ireland, and the Minister will be aware that I live along the Loch Shore uh, of Loch Ney, which sort of falls between two stools, between Deira and yourself, and yet there's an untapped potential. But there's also, um, with a number of now new users of Loch Ney, um, there was a, actually a jet ski accident in, in my area last week and uh, it's just that there, there's no nobody seems to be responsible for the rules and I know that Waterways Ireland told us uh, that at one stage there was some work going on about whether or not they could take over responsibility for the navigation uh, of Loch Ney. and there's also of course the Loch Ney partnership I just wonder minister would you uh, take some time to have a look at that I don't know whether it all falls across your brief or whether it goes across DERA but it, it is something that is a big concern there's huge numbers of people using jet skis some think there's no uh, speed limit supply on the lock and there's a, a huge increase in the freshwater swimming so it, it is a, an accident waiting to happen so I just wondered where that uh, discussions were at with DERA and Waterways Ireland and indeed that would be through the NSMC in terms of the extension of the area of responsibility for Waterways Ireland? Yeah, as you say, it doesn't fall yeah. solely within my department, but I'm happy to work with Minister Poots and with others to see you know, what we may be able to do to enhance our blue infrastructure. And just one final point, Chair, because you know we are looking into a very tense time, uh, and I know that uh, I think TU has had the Commission report on flags and elements and whatever, and obviously infrastructure has a role to play in terms of flags, etc. Just wondered, have you had any feedback from TO as when that report might likely be published or what implications there will be for infrastructure department? Yeah, there is consideration being given by the executive. Um, you know, this is an issue that is of concern right across the board to all members and to communities. And I think the right approach and the sustainable approach is if we can get you know, uh, agreement and partnership right across the executive, but also working with local communities and working with the councils. I'm just very mindful that we worked as across a number of departments around the issue of bonfires in the summer, and it worked in a number of areas. And again, that was the collaboration. It was about that commitment at the highest level, um, and it was about early intervention as well. So I think that's certainly a model that works, and I think we need to look to see where we can extend that collaboration and that agreement in terms of approach right across the board, particularly in the issue of, of flags and emblems as well. well uh, Chair, if I might, I have to put on record my thanks to uh, Superintendent Barney O'Connor in Lurgan PSNI, who worked quite a bit and taken down some very offensive posters with local uh, community, very sinister, very threatening. And I think there is there is real concern, I think, up in the East Derry area, where I think there's um, um, some uh, police officers being targeted through posters that are going up on, on posts and things as well. You know, so I'll maybe speak later to the minister about that. But it's obviously a policing matter. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Yes, me. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I suppose really just to conclude, to conclude, I am very mindful of your response to, to Roy Beggs and, and I certainly don't want to pour cold water on your ambition because I think that we all should be ambitious for Northern Ireland, even if that does include um, projects such as a tunnel or, or bridge to Scotland. Um, but I suppose I, I would urge caution in relation to raising expectations and and I know that you've given a commitment to a long list of priorities um, um, during your, your, your time as Minister. But I suppose really as we move towards the end of the mandate, I suppose it's about being conscious of, of budgets as well as to what you can realistically deliver and, and making those your priorities. And I suppose I would, I'd be interested to hear you know, what your plan then will be um, for the incoming year and what's achievable. And I suppose you do have to be very cognizant of your budget. I suppose this time round, you know, we have a healthier capital budget than we've had for some time. I think the challenge here is around the development of schemes. Um, it takes a very long time here to get schemes to the point of construction. And I think that's an issue. I would welcome the committee's thoughts on that. It was an issue that we had begun to discuss as an executive prior to the pandemic hitting. Um, I think there's room for improvement there, um, but we're committed to executive flagship. There is there is areas to to do improvements on. I'm always mindful that you have to be ambitious, but be realistic with people 
um, as well. And so that's the approach that I'll continue to make. We are advancing a number of projects. Um, as an executive, I'm playing my role in that. But there's also a lot of things that we can be doing here that don't cost the sun, the moon and the stars. Uh, I'm very mindful that in local communities, whether it's the extension of a walkway or whether it's a pedestrianisation of a town centre, these are things that really make a difference. Parklets really make a difference. And sometimes the feedback that I get from communities is it's not the huge multi-billion pound projects that make a difference. It's the small projects in their areas that are really transforming the physical space. That's why I'm very keen to push the um, Rethink the West Link proposal as well, which is by greening the West Link, which is a hugely concrete area that is sadly subject to some great sadness and tragedy in terms of mental health. That won't cost the sun and the moon and the stars but it will make a massive difference. And so that's why I think there, we need to kind of reorientate sometimes when we're ministers, because we think we can stand cutting the ribbon on the big, big projects. When actually, with that big sum of money, you could actually do huge work right across communities, transforming them. So for me, it's about trying to get that balance right. Uh, and I think that with sometimes with small sums of money, which can take a lot of effort, but for small sums of money, you can really make a big difference in people's lives. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate that we have overrun um, by some time. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and to Jeremy, and obviously Shan got off very lightly I know. today. I'm not complaining. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll, that's a challenge for the next time. Um, so thank you very much. Dave. Thank you. Members, we'll move on to our next briefing, which is from the Department in respect of the budget. You'll find table papers at page 7, um, which is the budget briefing paper, and at page 15 is the Minister for Finance statement from um, yesterday's plenary. Um, we'll welcome an uh, attending via Starleaf. Uh, we have Linda McHugh, the Acting Deputy Secretary, Suzanne, Suzanne Anderson, the Director of Finance, and John Irvine, the Director of Major Projects and Procurement. Not coming in vision now. Good afternoon. Um, Linda, John, Susan. Afternoon. You're all very welcome to the committee this afternoon, and apologies for um, the slight delay. You can, you can blame maybe the minister for that. Um, so, if um, Linda, if you'd like to make an opening yes. statement, I'm assuming that you're going to take the lead, and um, if it's appropriate, then as we go through questions, perhaps if we address our questions to you, and then you can distribute amongst colleagues. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chair, um, for the opportunity today to brief the committee on the Department's budget outcome for 21-22. I'm joined today, as you say, by Susan Anderson, Finance Director and Director of Capital Projects, um, John Irvine. And um, I suppose to start with, um, the Minister of Finance made a statement to the Assembly on the 1st of April confirming the Executive's final 21-22 budget. And the department is currently preparing main estimates on the basis of those budget allocations. At this stage, the minister has not yet taken final decisions in relation, in relation to opening budget allocations within the department. However, I will outline this morning, well, sorry, it's now this afternoon, um, the extent of the funding received for um, both the resource and capital budgets. So, first of all, in terms of resource, the department's resource budget outcome is. 429.9 million, which, when compared to the 2021 20, budget um, of 417.9 million, is very disappointing. Um, it's a cash increase of 12 million, or 3%, on the 21-22 opening position. However, 9.2 million of this has been earmarked by the executive to meet COVID pressures in Northern Ireland water, with the small balance going to cover other Northern Ireland water pressures. And whilst that's very welcome, there is clearly no uplift then for the rest of the department's requirements. Um, so although overall the budget is a small cash uplift, 
when inflationary pay and price uplifts are taken into account, actually that represents a real terms reduction for the whole of the department. Um, Apart from the Northern Water allocations, none of the department's resource bids um, above the 2021 opening baseline, including COVID pressures, were met. These bids are essential to ensure the continuation of many basic public services, including the adequate provision of public transport, maintenance of roads and water courses, winter grissing, planning services and active travel initiatives. In addition to the current resource allocation, the executive has, however, confirmed in-year amounts as part of the budget, and a further 12.5 million has been set aside for Northern Ireland Water. So in effect, this will ensure the department is able to meet um, the current regulator's draft determination for Northern Ireland Water for this current year, um, and that's very welcome. Um, we are anticipating that the final determination will be published in mid-May, and should this recommend an increase on the draft determination figure, this will be bid for as soon as there's an opportunity to do so. Whilst the additional commitments for Northern Water, as I said, are, are welcome, the overall resource outcome is clearly extremely challenging, particularly in light of ongoing losses of in, loss of income as a result of COVID-19, and very difficult decisions will be required if further funding is not secured in year. This will also have significant impact implications for Northern Ireland's economic recovery, driven through the programme for government. Um, in terms then of COVID pressures, um, these have not been addressed in the current budget, with the exception of the allocation of, of 9.8 million for Northern Ireland water. This means that estimated pressures of a further 58.8 million are still unfunded and will therefore need to be bid for as part of COVID funding exercises during the year. Although funding was received in 2021 to support financial stability within the department's arms length bodies, this will quickly be eroded if additional funding is not provided this financial year to meet the impact of COVID. So turning now to capital, um, the requirement for next year uh, of 811 million is substantially higher than in previous years due to the spend profile of a number of major projects and the investment requirements for Northern Ireland Water as set out in the regulator's draft determination. 722.5 million has been allocated against this requirement um, in the budget. This is 165 million more than 2020's opening position but still short of the requirement that was bid for. Um, and I think that the minister actually referenced this in, in, in your, her discussions with you. You know, a huge proportion of that budget is already pre-committed. Um, 520 million alone um, is required to meet DFI's existing commitments. And those include flagship projects, funding to meet the regulatory requirements in Northern Ireland Water, and uh, inescapable or contractually pre-committed projects. Um, the capital allocation does not include um, 25 million for low emission buses relating to tranche two of the UK government's commitment of 50 million over two years within the new decade new approach document. Um, requirements for those projects that DFI will deliver on behalf of City Deal or Growth Scale Partners, and 56 million which was bid for as a replacement um, for the Connecting Europe facility funding. Um, so those haven't been included in, in the current budget. Although this increase in capital will allow investment, which will be vital if we are to deliver essential economic recovery for, from the COVID, COVID pandemic, as was already highlighted in your session with the Minister earlier, it will be extremely challenging to deliver a capital programme at this scale within what is a very constrained budget uh, resource budget. The two budgets go hand in hand, and additional resource budget is essential to develop and support the delivery of this significant capital programme. So in closing, I hope that this briefing has outlined the challenges that the Minister faces and the difficult financial decisions that she's currently considering. It's important, I think, to reiterate that the Minister is, is clearly keen to get the Committee's views um, and support in shaping and delivering improvements to people's everyday lives, and she welcomes your constructive input. So thank you. Um, Susan, John and I are now happy to take any questions that, that um, you or the committee members may have.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, that's very much appreciated. Um, just a query, really, from yesterday's minister, uh, finance minister's statement. Um, within um, one of the table G of his statement, he had um, indicated £16 million for Northern Ireland water pensions and also £10 million for Belfast Harbour Commissioners um, for borrowing. Could you maybe mm. explain what those two items actually were for? Yeah, so th those relate to um, last year. Um, so towards the end of last year, um, we identified um, a need in Northern Water um, to uh, bridge a, a hole in their pension fund. Um, you know, they have a fully funded pension scheme, um, which, again, I think because of, of um, the uh, financial hit of COVID, um, was showing a shortfall. Um, so, uh, because there was money available, um, we bid for money to, to shore up that hole um, last year, because otherwise it would have actually increased on the resource pressures in this year. Um, the alternative to putting £16 million in, in, in one lump sum was to actually um, develop a repayment plan, which would have meant um, you know, millions going in, but over maybe a three or four year period. Um, so that's um, the, the Northern Water Pensions. And in terms of the borrowing for Belfast Harbour, um, that is not funding that we have provided to the port. Um, because the port uh, is a public corporation, any borrowing that it takes out itself, even if that's with a commercial bank, is seen as public debt. And therefore, it has to score somewhere in public accounts. So for public accounts purposes, um, it's scored against our budget and we need budget cover for that. So again, you know, that's something that um, we managed to secure um, towards the end of the last financial year to allow um, Belfast Harbour to borrow money. Um, but I must reiterate, it's not money that we're providing. Um, it's simply budget cover in government accounting terms, if that makes sense. I can bring Susan in to explain the delicacies of um, government accounting if um, I haven't uh, explained it just clearly enough. I think that's fine, unless um, Susan has something additional to add to that. <laughs> I'm not hearing from nope. Susan. <laughs> okay, I think that's... I mean, I suppose the main thing is that, that you know, it, it wasn't um, uh, a loan or, you know, a grant or anything that we were providing through the department. It's simply that, that um, the harbour wanted to, to borrow money to um, affect some of its development opportunities. Um, and we needed to provide the cover in government accounting terms for the debt that that would create. Okay. Um, and just further to the statement yesterday, um, the finance minister also um, raised an issue with regards to perhaps potential underspends um, um, from departments. Are you anticipating an underspend? Uh, absolutely not, no. Um, and certainly um, on resource, I think it will be a real struggle to um, uh, to live within the budget that we've currently been, been allocated and, and we will be bidding and, and bidding hard um, for the resource budget that we need. Um, we're also clearly going to be monitoring capital. Um, a lot depends, I think, on, on some of the issues actually that you discuss with the minister around um, the ability to, to deliver capital projects, but we're keeping a very close eye on that. Um, and uh, we also have some contingency measures that we're looking at um, in case any of the, the, the big spending projects get delayed because of either legal challenge or you know, planning permissions or, or, or whatever, um, you know, as the Minister said, um, capital projects can get delayed. So we're looking at contingency measures so that we ensure that we um, uh, spend out our budget. Oh, sorry, I maybe just misunderstood me. It was really just in relation to last year's budget. You're not anticipating a, having had a, an, any underspend? Oh, sorry, last year's? Yes, no. Um, no, but um, Susan, if, if you're there, maybe you want to say a bit more about that? I can't actually hear 
dark shadow there, so... No. Sorry, I think I'm having connection problems now, too. Sorry, we can't hear from Susan at all. No. No, well, look, um, no, at the moment, um, we don't expect um, any, any significant underspends. Um, you know, we work really hard to, to make sure that we met our budget. Um, and, um, you know, we did, we did, we were successful, as, as I've already discussed, about getting some additional monies towards the end of the financial year. So we certainly don't expect or anticipate any, any major underspends. Thank you. And just obviously, again, I suppose with regards to the imbalance between capital and resource, um, we'll, we'll have a clearer picture of what that actually means in the next couple of weeks, I imagine, once decisions are, are made around um, the pri prioritisation of spend. <coughs> yeah, I, th I think that's right. Um, and, you know, the, the Minister will have to look at um, how she allocates um, budget against her priorities. Okay, and, ju and just finally, can you give us an idea what the, the outlook is like for TransLink and Northern Ireland Water for the incoming year? Yeah, so I mean, for Northern Ireland Water, um, I, I suppose the, the big unknown is how quickly um, you know, the economic recovery will be from from COVID. Um, you know, for Northern Ireland Water, at least we've got um, their estimated COVID pressures met already. Um, so, you know, I. I I think it's it's probably a lot brighter for, for Northern Ireland Water because we've got those additional commitments, um, you know, not only in the budget but the additional um, commitment of twelve million um, for in-year bidding um, as a sort of a, a pre-committed uh, figure. Um, I think there may be a challenge with Northern Ireland Water as and when the um, final determination um, is made by the utility regulator because. If the figure is significantly higher um, than the draft determination, then we will clearly have to bid for that, um, so so that Northern Ireland Water can meet its regulatory commitments. I think for TransLink, it's going to be uh, a lot more difficult. Um, you know, again, towards the end of last financial year, we were successful um, in uh, bidding for funding to, to shore up some of it, its um, uh, reserves, which had been depleted year on year for a number of years. Um, and uh, it's it's good that we've managed to um, secure uh, Translink's financial position for the moment, but you know none of its um, estimated COVID pressures were met in the budget. And if we can't get additional COVID pressures met, then I think it will be a very challenging year for for Translink. Um, and the uh, monies that we were able to um, put into showing up reserves will not be sufficient to see them through the financial year if we don't get additional money. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms Kimmins? Thank you, Chair, and, th and thanks, Linda. Um, just a couple of questions. The last time, I suppose, Linda, we discussed the budget. The, the constraint, the restraint from the correspondent was discussed, and of course, um, pressure will remain. But since the department has now paid around an additional um, ten million of resource funding, can can you give any detail about what that will mean for the department in terms of service provision? Sorry, which ten million? Um, I'm, resource funding. We have, we have some additional resource, um, but that's been earmarked for Northern Ireland Water. So okay. it, it affects um, the, the 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 rest of the department, including TransLink. Um, you know, we we are looking at, at living within the baseline for 2021. So there's been no uplift, okay. um, and that will be a real challenge um, because clearly costs and and um, inflation. You know, even even just taking inflationary um, figures into account, um, it's going to be a real challenge. Okay, um, and I suppose in terms of the draft budget, then, and I know you've said there what has been asked for um, isn't what was received, but I think there's already been a big, there has been a, a significant increase from last year. So it's from six six hundred and ninety million to seven twenty two. But do you have does the department have any idea then how it tends to allocate the the increase um, in this funding? Yeah, I mean, I think the increase um, in funding requirement is really because a lot of the um, uh, commitments, the um, flagship, the NDNA commitments, um, 
are reaching um, a point in, the, in their spend profile where they're starting to spend serious money. Um, so, you know, uh, the minister is yet to make final decisions, but you know, with that level of capital resource or capital budget, um, you know, she should be able to meet all of her flagship and <coughs> DNA commitments. And then the, ne the next priority will be all of those things that are pre-committed, either um, because they're statutory requirements or because there's, there are contractual requirements. Um, yeah. And then there'll be, you know, a, a small bit left at the end for the minister to make some discretionary decisions on. Um, but you know, she hasn't got to, to that final point yet. Okay. Um, my final question, just I'd, I'd raised with the minister around the Southern Relief Road, and it was just to try and get um, a wee bit of detail on on those the city detail uh, the city deal projects. Um, yeah. uh, for example, I think that's it's an example from the own area um, on that. Okay, could I maybe bring John Irvine in at that point? Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the minister, you, you were discussing the Newry Southern Relief Road earlier with the minister, uh, and essentially where we are with that is that it's one of the three infrastructure projects in the Belfast Region City Deal, and the, uh, uh, the City Deal partners are currently looking at all the, the outlined business cases to determine which projects go forward into the deal. So, so that's one element of this. So, so whether it goes to the deal, through to the deal or not, uh, you know, is a decision for Belfast Region City Deal partners, and, and they're looking at that at the minute. In, in terms of where we are with the scheme, it, it, it's well developed. The, the, the issue about fixed or lifting bridge is still to be resolved. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, when, when that is resolved, uh, I, I, then the, the project can move forward, uh, uh, depending on you know what happens with with the city deal. Okay, well, that's fair enough. Thank you, John. That, that's all the questions I have. Chair, thank uh, Elin as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Linda, my question relates around structural maintenance. Um, mm -hmm. You've obviously a seventy, sorry, forty-five million under high priority and a seventy-five million under inescapable. So obviously, those, those two figures are roughly one hundred and twenty million. What's that? What's that sort of in comparison to other years? Obviously, you've got a 29% uplift in capital expenses or you know, money, should I say. So what, what, is, what does that turn into, that 120 million this year from previous years? And is that getting the same percentage increase, the 29%? Yeah, again, um, I'll ask John to um, talk about that because you know, he'll be over more of the detail on the roads budget. So um, I, I think the, the outturn this year in structural maintenance is probably around the 100 million mark. So 120 is a significant uplift. Um, uh, I, 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 and also uh, it's at the start of the year, which allows it to be planned uh, more efficiently. Uh, as the minister alluded to earlier, uh, we have an issue we're working through at the minute on some resurfacing contracts with our legal advisors. and. Um, uh, we, we'll have to deal with that, and, and I hope you appreciate it's, it's a live procurement issue, uh, and we're taking legal advice. So uh, I, I really can't uh, sort of give any more detail on that at the minute. Um, but but essentially, the starting point this year for structural maintenance is, is higher than the outturn last year. And John, I suppose the question I asked the minister, and I'll ask probably you the same: Do you have any concerns? Can you know spending that? Additional twenty percent. You know, you're now spending one hundred and twenty million, whereas last year you spent one hundred million. And obviously, if that, yeah, let's call it that issue in the background. Yeah. So it, it, it's about well, it's about ma making sure we maximise our capacity to deliver. So, you know, I hope the committee will appreciate. I think we're we're a can-do organisation, and you know, we 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 generally uh, you know spend our budgets. So, um, you know, we, we'll be we're actually sitting down next week. Uh, to bring the key people together in a workshop to make sure we maximise our capacity to deliver this. So we, we've got our own people and we've got our uh, you know strategic partners. Uh, so so we are focused on this. Uh, as the minister said, uh, you know it will be challenged, challenging. Uh, and, and I think with the, the the issue across the the department as a whole about about staff resources w was flagged up. Um, but. You know, we're, we're focused on delivery, and uh, we're hopeful that we will be able to deliver on this. And, and will will uh, John, Mister and Mrs. Public, 
see the benefits of that 20%? Will they see it in their road up there, you know, country lane? Will they see the benefit of that 20%? Will, will it be visually in front of them? Well, so the, the road network in Northern Ireland is like 25,000 kilometres long. So when you, when you spread, you know, a 20 million increase across that whole network, you know, it, it maybe won't be terribly visible, but actually, what, you know, it will deliver more resurfacing and surface dressing uh, on particularly in the rural roads that that's that's you know uh, uh, you know on, on the rural roads to, to maintain the surface and, the, and to seal it up from water damage you know surface dressing in rural areas people would see a lot of that um, so and the other thing the minister mentioned she's focused on on uh, you know rural roads improvement funds so focusing more on rural areas so you know, it, 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 I think it, it, it will be visible in terms of the, the, the outturns at the end of the year, whether people, because of the, the size of the network, will actually notice a difference. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but certainly the outturns will be different. But it's important that that 20% doesn't get swallowed up. I appreciate the larger roads, more, more traffic, more dangerous, more speed, all that needs to be safe. But it's important that 20% doesn't be swallowed up. You know, by doing an extra mile there, where there's, there's lots and lots, and I'm championing the rural roads. They need to be maintained better than what they are. Yeah. So, so you know, I think over a number of years, and uh, the, this minister and previous minister had a focus on rural roads, and um, but because of the resource pressures on the day-to-day -day maintenance and, and the way uh, repairs have to be prioritised, then there certainly there became issues in rural areas, and that's why then. Uh, you have this focus on a rural roads fund to to sort of bring those back up the standard, and as the minister said earlier, she's focused on that as well. Okay, and final question, chair, just on regarding in the on the high priority, John, is a 1.25 million uh, A29 Cookstown bypass. So, sort of, what's that doing, and, and where's that head? What direction is that heading now? So, uh, it, it's 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 advancing uh, well. Uh, we're we're moving towards uh, so that. You, in any major roads project, you start off with feasibility options, and then you develop that and you narrow it down before you go to uh, draft orders and then uh, potentially a public inquiry. So we're rapidly approaching the the the, the point where we can take to the minister uh, a, a proposition for draft orders, uh, and the time frame on that is the second half of this year. Okay, thank you, John and Linda and Chair. Thank you, and Mr. Boylan. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Linda, and John, and Susan. Um, just a couple of points, Linda. Obviously, the reserves have been reinstated in terms of Translink and DVA. Um, do you foresee any more COVID pressures this year in relation to to the likes of Translink and, and DVA? Yes, we do. Um, and you know, I think they've been estimated at, at this point in time. So. Um, uh, Translink's estimated a £50 million pressure this year. Um, that is based on their best estimate as to you know, how quickly people will return to public transport based on you know, the, the planned staged rec recovery from COVID that, that the executive has produced. And I suppose you know, they, they've made assumptions on when um, certain parts of society and, and business and leisure are going to get back. Um, so, yeah, that they reckon they're they're going to have um, potentially about a, a fifty million pound pressure. Um, DVA. Um, I mean, you've heard that that um, driving tests are coming back. They they are trying to get um, the MOT testing back, but you know that they will still be losing um, clearly some some of their income this year to a lesser extent. Um, I think from memory, it's it's around three. Four minutes. No, hold on. I'll tell you exactly. Um, yes, yeah, about five million. They reckon there'll be COVID pressure this year, um, and then roads and rivers will also maybe have another three point four million. Crumlin Road Jail, one hundred thousand, and Rathlin Ferry, three hundred thousand. So that that makes up total COVID pressures of fifty eight point eight million. Fifty eight. And see, just in terms of um, no, thanks for that answer there. See, in terms of uh, let's see, the capital allocation you would have, you haven't that capital allocation hasn't been finalised yet. When will we see the 
finalisation of that capital allocation? Um, yeah, as the minister said earlier, she's still going to make final budget decisions within the, the, the next couple of weeks. Um, and I think particularly on capital, you know, she wants to, to make a fairly quick decision because the quicker we know where capital is going to be spent, mm -hmm. you know, the quicker they can go after the spend. You know, So um, she's, she's focusing on that one first. Right, and just two final points quickly. In, in terms of COVID spend last year and your projections for this year, roughly, can you give us a percentage of what you think it's going to be, or up or down, or any well, idea? Yeah, I mean, last year I think we got about a um, hundred and um, hold on, got it somewhere. I think it was about one hundred and ninety-five million we got in terms of COVID, and that was that was a mixture of um, you know, loss of income, increased costs, and then also. Money for the the, the schemes, the, the the bus and coach and taxi schemes. Um, so you know there is going to be. We don't we don't expect that there'll be just as much pressure this year. Um, you know, uh, but I mean, it's still significant, significant. If, we don't, if, if we don't get the the monies in. Um, no, that's, that's fair. That's fair enough. And if you if you have any more detail, maybe you can send on the committee. So just finally, then in terms of, is there any money earmarked for the likes of? Additional support for the likes of um, the transport sector, the taxis or the buses. Is anyone going to earmark that in, in, in the plan? Um, do you mean a, a further scheme or? Yeah, just further supports in, in, you know, in the coming year for obviously recovery and coming out of, you know, yeah, COVID. Just, and I mean, again, I think that would be an executive decision. You know, we've, we've got the approval for um, the schemes that, that we're running, um, but so far, We've got neither budget nor um, you know, nor a commitment for for any further schemes. I think that's something that would need to be considered by the minister and the executive. And just to be common, John, I support my colleague, Mr. Buchanan, there, try and get so much as much money as possible out to the rural roads as possible. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. I'm just sort of mindful of time as well. Um, we still have two um, further members to ask questions with Mr. Beggs and Ms. Anderson. So I can call Mr. Beggs in the first instance. Hello again. Thanks for that update uh, so far. Um, just a, a query that I have, probably John might be his best place to, to answer it in terms of structural maintenance. Um, there's inescapable structural maintenance and then there is high pr priority structural maintenance and thanks Keith for pointing that out I'd missed that um, can you uh, detail what the difference is uh, I'll maybe I'll, I'll maybe revert to Linda but maybe it, structural maintenance is all structural maintenance is all the same thing uh, it, it's uh, uh, I suspect it's part of uh, the how we bid to DOF uh, <coughs> and prioritize our bids Linda yeah, I mean, I suppose inescapable means that we're already committed to doing it. Um, uh, the rest is, um, you know, high priority means that we really would like to do it if at all possible. But inescapable means that that you know there there is a contract in place and we need to to fulfil that and complete it. Okay, th th thanks. Thanks for that. Again, you yeah, add those two together, that's 120 million. But did, did I hear the figure of 100 million being mentioned rather than the 120 million? And if so, why why is there a different figure? Sorry, I'll come to that. So uh, the previous question uh, uh, was about the capacity to deliver. So the 100 million uh, is probably the outturn in, in the last financial year. So I was trying to compare last with this to show that the 120 was a bit more. Okay, and uh, so having gotten 120 million, can you give us reassurance that potholes will be uh, repaired on a timely basis? Because uh, you know that is still an ongoing problem, as others have said, but particularly on rural roads, but sometimes actually on more uh, more strategic roads as well. So, so we have to make a distinction here. So structural maintenance is capital because that's renewing the, the pavement and extending the life. So that, okay. that's feel is renewal. Potholes are repaired uh, on the day-to-day -day maintenance, which, which is resource. Um, the resource budget is the one that's under pressure. So uh, depending on how the minister allocates the, the, the resource to the road maintenance activities will depend on the level of service that can be provided this financial year for the likes of you know, 
pothole repair, grass cutting, gully emptying, street lighting repairs. So, so you have this difference, as, as you alluded to earlier, capital and resource, but, but that's how the funding falls out and then the, 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 the minister has to deal with that and allocate accordingly. Okay. Uh, a question then on the capital requirements. On, on table two in your briefing, um, at the bottom it lists not included in the budget city deal 1.9 NDNA 25 million and EU 25 sorry 55.6 million mm -hmm. can I have clarity is this money that's coming from other sources or is this money that's not there this is money that we um, anticipate will come from other sources so NDNA low emissions you know we, we've um, had one tranche of 25 million so that that's the second tranche um, the uh, connecting Europe, well, the city deals, um, I mean, that's also been a UK government commitment. Um, and we're working with our city deal partners to, to just um, bottom out what, what can and will be spent this year. Um, and that's coming from a city deal budget pot. Um, I suppose that the, 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 the bigger area, which is more unknown, is you know, what and how will we replace um, the 55 odd million from the Connecting uh, Europe facility? And, and again, you know, there's been a commitment by the UK government that, um, you know, they will look at that. But that, I think, is, is um, the one where I would be less certain that, that you know, we, we just don't know how that's going to be replaced and the UK government hasn't told us yet. Um, so that's separate to the budget allocations in the, the current block from the current block grant allocation that Treasury's provided. So, so, so that's your, your your requirement. So if it's not fully funded, then that will um, impact on what you can actually deliver in terms of your capital program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's something you'll you'll just have to manage as uh, as we go along. Um, in in terms of um, Improve, improving um, roads such as uh, the A77 and the A75, which are major network routes from Northern Ireland, the, the island of Ireland, uh, servicing uh, drivers from the Republic as well as our, our own. Are there ongoing discussions with Scotland or UK government in terms of uh, funding for it? Um. I haven't been party to those, um, and I think those would probably be discussions that would be happening, um, you know, at, at, a, at a wider level. Um, I mean, I, I know that, that that Scotland is very keen to upgrade those two roads, um, but um, I haven't been involved in any discussions. I think that's that's more a, a political discussion around, um, you know, union connectivity um, in its wider sense. Should should we as a as a department not be chipping into that as well because that, that affects as I said transport coming uh, from Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland yeah well I mean all, all I all, all I can say is that I haven't been involved in, in any discussions on that um, so and it, it's really outside my remit I'm just concentrating on getting the money oh, from okay um, at the moment to be honest Okay, um, then in terms of um, reservoirs, um, mm -hmm. uh, again, we were given a confidential briefing. Um, it's good to hear that that uh, powers are uh, coming coming into place again, so something may be able to be done in the future. Uh, I'm just seeking reassurance that, uh, that that was listed as a resource pressure, so is there sufficient funds to ensure that um, critical staff will be in place to, to manage those issues which may affect public safety? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're currently looking at, um, there's, there's quite a lot of vacancies in the department at the moment, um, and there is resource pressure, um, as, as I've said. Um, so we're looking at, at those posts that will be critical. Um, you know, um, we're looking at uh, as and when we get the um, legislation into the department, there will be a lead-in time because we're going to have to put in um, secondary legislation and work through the, the assembly process to do that. In the meantime, you know, both from a policy and legislative perspective and also from an operational perspective, um, there is a requirement for resource, which we're well aware of, and um, that's going to have to just factor into where the minister prioritises her budget. Okay. Then a final question in terms of, of uh, 
Translink and, and public transport. Mm -hmm. um, over the last number of years, there was a, a, a top level decision to underfund Translink so that it would run down its resources. Uh, I think roughly about 10 million a year. So it was knowing it was knowing that this level of funding given the Translink would deplete whatever resources they had, even aside from COVID, by about 10 million a year. Has that baseline been re reinstated? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't a decision that, that was made um, in the past with any great um, delight. Um, it was really the way that the department had to try and meet its budget. Um, the, the monies that we were able to, to um, bid for and secure towards the end of the financial year basically replaced um, the underfunding that the department had um, uh, had experienced with TransLink in terms of delivering on, on its um, public service agreement. Um, so it, it basically said, well, look, we didn't pay you enough in the past four or five years, so here's the money that we should have been paying you in the past. So it's basically brought them up to where they should have been. Um, however, you know, as I said, you know, whilst it was very, very welcome that, that we were able to do that and, and justify it, um, without additional monies to meet their ongoing COVID pressures this year, that money will soon deplete. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Members, we have actually run out of time, um, but I can call uh, Ms. Anderson and, and then Mr. Muir, who's also indicated, but if you could keep your questions really brief, I'd appreciate it, Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. And a lot of my questions have been answered. Um, I wanted to ask about the 55 million on the Connecting European facility that we're lost as a consequence of being dragged out of the EU. And Linda, you have confirmed that there's no confirmation by the British government that it's going to replace that European funding and the Shared Prosperity Fund. We heard much about it that, that um, was going to replace the loss of Europe. London. So I've heard what you said about that. Can I ask you, Linda, about the EQIA at the draft budget meeting? I, I asked the department um, and they told me that they were undertaking a, a, a quality impact assessment. So can I get an update of that? Because we have some finished now finalised important differences from where we were in the draft and where we are now. Yeah. So, you know, we did carry out an EQIA on the draft. Um, and as soon as the minister's made her decisions, we'll be carrying out the EQIA then on, on the final decisions. So that will also be published um, when the yeah, final time decisions are made. Um, well, uh, as the minister said herself, um, uh, she's hoping to make decisions in, in, in the coming weeks. So as soon as those decisions are made, we'll, we'll get the EQIA up as, as soon as we can. Okay. Can I ask you just in relation to the wastewater and sewage? You know, I've been quite focused yes. on that in, in, in the city. And, you know, at, again, at the draft budget uh, briefing, you stated that you intend and you repeated it today to uh, to meet the, the NA water bid in full. And um, now, obviously, within the, the draft determination of the utility regulation yes. regulator. But can you... Um, can I have an update in relation to the final budget, given that it has seen an increase? And you mentioned that there was 10 million being kept aside for NA Water. So the, is the department, this will be question, the department and NA Water possible additional investment in our wastewater treatment plant and wastewater invest, uh, investment, mm -hmm. and particularly obviously focus on da in dairy because our capacity now has reached a full capacity and we need additional wastewater investment um, in, in dairy. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I suppose um, Northern Water, as you know, works on a six year business planning cycle mm -hmm. um, and that's approved by the regulator. So, you know, we have um, secured sufficient uh, funding at the moment, um, and particularly on the capital side, to meet all of Northern Water's capital commitments in the first year of the price control. If by the final determination, as I said, that, that figure goes up, then we'll have to look at, you know, how we do that. And, you know, if the minister's already allocated her capital budget at that point, um, and that's very likely to happen, and Northern Water needs more, then we're going to have to bid for more. Um, in the meantime, you know, as I said, we've also asked Northern Water if there are any other um, projects that they could think about in terms of contingency. In case capital budget is available throughout the year, um, you know, 
in monitoring rounds um, mm -hmm. from other parts of, of the system. So, I mean, we are looking to maximise, but I suppose as with the departments, um, they can only deliver a significant increase and, and their um, increase in capital programme is very significant. They will only really be able to do that if they can secure enough resource to, to be able to support the delivery of that as well. Um, so there is a limit to, to how much can be done in any one year. Um, well, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear, Linda, that you're engaging with NI Water and putting them on notice and getting them to think in case, for instance, there's money that comes available in monitoring rounds because, as I say, in Derry, we have reached capacity. Um, wastewater treatment plants need uh, need further capacity to be able to deal. And we're not going to be able to build, as we say, no, no drains, no cranes. So yes. look, I'm conscious that you're under pressure, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and I'll be brief because I'm conscious that, um, uh, that we're over time in relation to this. Um, just thank the officials for, for coming along here. Uh, I was going to say this morning, but it's this afternoon. Um, obviously, within the report, it's some of that's already uh, public and it's been reported upon and will be causing some concern in relation to the potential impact, particularly upon transport. Um, in the report that's been provided, it says in the financial year, there's likely to be significant impacts in public service delivery, including in areas such as public transport and roads maintenance. Um, we've previously got briefings in relation to this, and as we understand what the practical implications this could have on people and communities in Northern Ireland if there is an additional funding and the, the warnings in this report are borne out. Yeah, and I suppose you know, the impact, the, the ultimate impacts will depend on on the final decisions that the minister makes. Um, but you know, as as I've said and she said, you know, those are going to be difficult decisions because, you know, as we heard today, you know, public transport is really important, but people also care about the state of their roads. Um, and you know, if it's a choice between one or the other, or you know, underfunding both a bit, you know, those are the decisions that she's going to have to take. Um, and you know it, it will be difficult, and that's why um, you know with the, with the minister's support we will we will be bidding for um, more certainly on the resource side. Um, I think we'll, we'll have to be bidding as soon as we can bid um, for additional resource budgets, and the sooner we know that, the better. Yeah, I think sometimes it, it's an either or scene, and it isn't really you know good quality roads help good quality public transport, mm -hmm. help cyclists, help active travel. Like what Declan last night, and they came off a bike with a massive pothole. You know that, that has an impact upon so many people. And if we're going to have a green recovery, we need to have that good public transport network there to attract right. people onto it. So you know these are important issues. Yeah, and and those messages have been made very clearly and strongly by the minister in terms of. You know, the role that, that um, the range of services that actually we provide and fund are critical to the economic recovery as we bounce back from COVID. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I could not conceive that we will, you know, fulfil our economic um, potential post-COVID if, you know, the, the public transport system and, and our roads networks um, deteriorate. Yeah, no, it's a really important issue. Uh, just one thing, just uh, I'll be short here, obviously. John, just in relation to the capital budget, you've got uh, extra money there really in relation to that, but the resource budget hasn't increased. Is there anything else you're looking at and, and to ensure that we can deliver those projects whilst also acknowledging the resource budget hasn't increased? I know that there's some departments are looking at different ways to be able to manage that, um, whether it's capitalisation of resource to ensure that we can get those projects delivered. Yeah. Okay. So, so I mentioned earlier about trying to maximise capacity, and, mm -hmm. and we're, we're uh, you know, going to meet next week to think about that. We, we can actually draw on uh, a strategic consultancy partner to help. So that's, uh, and then we've also got uh, external consultancy partners. So, um, uh, you know, where where we need to boost in house resources, that is uh, is a possibility to, to help delivery. And, and, and we're kind of working our way through that at the minute. So, you know, it's going to be a challenging year, but we're yeah. focused on this uh, to see, you know, how we can make sure we deliver it. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and just thank you all for the work that you're doing. And relation, it's an extremely challenging situation in terms of trying to turn around things in the context we're within, but I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, and can I just pass on my thanks to you, Linda, and to, to John and to Susan, who I think seem to have issues around... Uh, our connection and I uh, and appreciate that the work will, that she will have done even to prepare for, for the meeting today. So um, thank you, thank the three of you for, for attending 
and no doubt we'll see you in the not too distant future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, obviously we um, referred to the Phoenix Law Correspondence earlier. So if members are content to agree that we seek advice as to how we address that, that issue in respect of it having come from a solicitor. Okay. Looking then to forward work programme, just draw your attention to that at page 138. Um, members are content. Don't have any other business, I don't think, either. No one's notified me. Um, the date and time of the next meeting is 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 28th of April, in room 29 of Parliament Buildings, and we're going to be receiving briefings on SL1 associated with the A1 and also with regard to the Living with Water programme. So if, um, if members are content, we'll conclude the meeting and just advise those who are in the room just to maintain social distancing as we leave. Thank you very much. The meeting's now adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.